I'm Jake Monaco, the poser for Be Cool Scooby Doo, and you're listening to a podcast named Scooby Doo. Yeah. yeah. Hey gang, and welcome to a very special episode of a podcast named Scooby-Doo. As I record this, it is the early evening of December 24th, 2017. And since it is the season, I figured I would try something a little bit different this time around. But before I talk about that, I want to just address a bit of Scooby-Doo news that I think everybody in the community and the animation world is already aware of, and that is the passing of Heather North on November 30th of this year. Now, most of you know that Heather North was the voice of Daphne Blake. She took on the role in 1970, taking over from uh, Stefaniana Christofferson, and continued to voice Daphne through various iterations of the franchise, on and off until her final performance in the role in 2003's Monster of Mexico. Many reports are saying that North died after a long battle with an undisclosed illness. TMZ reported that she died of a heart attack brought on by respiratory disease. Regardless of the cause, uh, the loss of North is a huge loss to the Scooby community. And my thoughts, as I'm sure all of yours, are with North's family and friends at this time. It's, It's one thing to lose somebody, it's another thing to lose somebody during a holiday season like Christmas where it's all about family and togetherness. So wishing North's family the very best this holiday season. Uh, Our condolences and thoughts are with you. Now, on to more lighter things. Uh, The show this month is going to be a bit of a digression, diversion. It's going to be a little different. Instead of doing my usual interview shtick, I decided that since it's Christmas and there are a number of Scooby-Doo Christmas episodes and I was trying to think of sort of a Christmas angle to take on the show this month, I thought, I'm just going to embrace that whole animated special variety show kind of goofball fiasco and try and put something together that's a little offbeat, a little bit out of left field, and that hopefully will entertain you guys. So I've enlisted the aid of a number of Scooby-Doo podcasts, as well as a couple of special guests. I'm swinging for the fences here. I don't know if I have succeeded 100%. I'm sure you will be the final arbiters of that, but it's going to be a bit of a long one. I think we're running around or just over two hours for this one, so I'm going to try and just cut it off here and not talk anymore and uh, send you along into the little audio presentation that I have prepared for you. So without further ado, I present to you the very first a podcast named Scooby-Doo Christmas Special, The Do Meaning of Christmas. We'll see you on the other side. Greetings to you, followers of the Great Dane and the Gang of Mystery. I am the ghost, yes, the ghost of Jacob Marley, formerly of the firm of Scrooge and Marley. 
I can tell by the looks on your faces that you are doubting your senses. Well, while it might be reasonable for you to doubt, I can assure you that I do indeed exist and appear here before you. I am no slight disorder of the stomach, as you might think. Not the result of a bit of bad beef and mustard for dinner, but a messenger from beyond the grave. Ha 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 ha! Now, now that I have completed my affairs with my former partner in business, I have been sent to you as part of my penance. My task here is to offer you a glimpse at the true spirit of the season. I have been led to believe that some of you might be faltering in your seasonal resolve, and I am here to rectify that state of affairs. This will be accomplished through three visitations by spirits not unlike myself. You will experience ghostly apparitions <laughs> who bring with them Scooby-Doo episodes of Christmas past, present, and the Christmas yet to be. Each of these episodes will help you understand the do meaning of Christmas and allow me to finally move on to my just reward. You can expect the first of these visitations. When the bell tolls one, it will come from Scooby-Doo's or Scooby-Don't's host, Billy Seguire, who will be discussing the original Scooby-Doo Christmas episode, The Nutcracker Scoob. Till next we meet. Freddy, I'm so glad you brought your friends here to help the children put on our Christmas pageant. Glad to help, Mrs. Featherwig. I think everything's finally set up. Not quite. Look at this antique nutcracker. Yeah, we gotta find a neat place for it. After all, the Nutcracker Suite is always part of our pageant. Welcome to the first segment of the show. This is our Scooby episode of Christmas Past. And to talk about the episode Nutcracker Scoob, we welcome back to the podcast friend of the show, Billy Seaguire from Scooby-Doo's or Scooby-Don'ts. Hello, very happy to return. Very happy to have you back. I am thrilled to be here, and I was so happy when you asked me to talk about the Nutcracker Scoob, uh, because I think I only watched it for the first time a few weeks ago on my own podcast. And you're like the resident expert on this episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to think so. Um, we know we've definitely seen every episode before it, and not too many after. We're into the thirteen ghosts of Scooby Doo right now. For those of you who don't know my show, it is uh, co-hosted with Amelia Wellman, and the pair of us are going through every episode of Scooby Doo chronologically. So it's a uh, two episodes a week. Yeah, you guys are machines. <laughs> We we planned it out from the beginning that it was a four-year project, <laughs> provided they don't make any more Scooby-Doo ever, which uh, I don't think they're going to do. They're going to continue, so so will we. They're already working on the new show, so... <laughs> they are, and the movies. <laughs> and the movies continue, yeah, it's true. Yeah, Daphne and Velma. I'm looking forward to that one. But we're not here to talk about Daphne and Velma. We're here to talk about the Nutcracker Scoob. Yeah. Uh, the the whole theme of the episode, of course, is to find the due meaning of Christmas. And honestly, this is a great place to start for a lot of reasons. One, it is the first Scooby-Doo Christmas episode ever produced. Mm -hmm. And it does have a lot of really kind of traditional, you know, Christmas themes of togetherness and friendship and, you know, treating other people nicely, even though it is like the most bizarre mishmash of Christmas concepts. It is. <laughs> it is. All right. Let's let's take the Nutcracker and then just combine it with all of Charles Dickens. Like, oh, you mean the Christmas Carol? No, no, no. I want to throw a little Nicholas Nickleby in there just for fun. Um, this is such a Christmas episode, first of all. Like, this is not a modern Happy Holidays episode. This is a, oh, let us all celebrate the Lord in the Manger. Merry Christmas. I almost got the feeling that when they approached this episode... Oh, I should probably mention who wrote and uh, directed this episode. Okay, so the episode was written by Charles M. Howell and Tom Ruger. 
Tom Ruger will be familiar to uh, Scooby-Doo fans as having worked on 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, uh, running mm-hmm. that show, and also a puppet named Scooby-Doo. And the episode's directors are Oscar Dufau and Rudy Zamora. Now, just what I was saying before uh, I remembered to introduce the writers and directors of the episode, it kind of feels like when they approached this, being the first Scooby kind of Christmas episode, it was like, we're going to put everything in the kitchen sink, almost like they they didn't know if they were ever going to have another opportunity to do this. I guess, to be fair, this is the last episode of the new Scooby-Doo Mysteries, is it not? It, it is. It absolutely is the last episode of the Scooby-Doo Mysteries. And this was a weird season, because if you're just watching this episode in isolation, you won't realize that Fred is actually a special guest in this episode, because this was a season where it was just... Daphne, Shaggy, Scooby, and Scrappy. Fred and Velma made sporadic appearances, but usually it it was like this, where it was either a solo Fred or a solo Velma episode. I think they had two other episodes where they were all there as a gang, but it was a lot more split up. That kind of reminds me a little bit of the uh, Shaggy and Scooby Doo get a clue. <laughs> Very much, yeah. Like that that was another example of just of just the boys on their own. Um, I'm I'm going to be honest, going through the uh, the later 70s and the 80s, it was a joy even when Daphne came back to the series, because like there's a reason that this gang works and splitting them up is tough <laughs> because Shaggy and, and Scooby have no reason to solve a mystery. They only get into hijinks. Well, they're, they're the cowards. They, they're there to run away and scream. <laughs> exactly. And maybe Scrappy is there to push them forward to fight. But no one needs to know who's under the mask. You either run away from them or you kill them. That's all they did. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but then Daphne comes back as an investigative journalist and sort of gives them a raison d'etre again. But it's, there's nothing like having Fred return. To me, Frank Welker is the heart of Scooby-Doo. And just hearing that voice makes it. I actually, I'm not as familiar with the new Scooby-Doo mysteries as you obviously are having just gone through them. So watching this episode, for me, it just felt like Velma was absent and Mm. I wasn't feeling that pleasure of having that, you know, return of a beloved character. Yeah. Whereas like from the actual perspective is, is you haven't had Fred in a while and just at least getting him for this is really meaningful. Like that to me, that, really goes on what the theme of the episode is in that, you know, bringing people together at Christmas time. That kind of explains the enthusiasm and joy you and Amelia have on your episode. <laughs> Absolutely. If if you hear this latest season, it, it it's also about quality because the quality of the episodes is directly proportional to how many members of the original gang are present. Interesting. Yeah. Also, uh, the episodes where either Fred or Velma come back... Uh, Those are always two-parters, like this one was. The other episodes are split up into two different storylines. Well, that does kind of make sense, because when there's other people around, you have more space for a mystery, whereas when it's just the three of them, like like you said, it's just hijinks. But it it works so much better this way. Like, I even really like the idea of putting a cliffhanger in the middle of the episode. Yeah, it is an interesting device, which... I've seen a couple Mm -hmm. of times on a couple of episodes kind of scattered throughout the franchise's run. But it's it's not too frequent. And it usually comes in this era when they were doing shorter little... The season where they did three episodes in a half an hour, that was... I lived through that, let me say. (laughs) Oh, I know. I know. Those were... Some of those were really painful. So you said the, the quality of the episode was in direct relation to the number of characters in the show. This show included almost everybody. So how would you... Where, where would you place this on, like, the well, quality? Well, I, I remember we did rank them when we did our stat count for this season, and this was one of my favorite episodes of the season. Th- this is it's very good. It has a full mystery to it. It has characters that you can kind of think, ooh, are, are you the villain? Do you have something behind you? And, and that's an aspect of the mystery that really in this era you don't get too much. You don't really get to to know characters that aren't the gang because they're just flying so fast, like leaving. And then you don't get to you, that. That's the other reason I like the two parter, because you get to know the side characters more. Now, mentioning the other characters, that's a nice segue to talking about some of the mm-hmm. supporting cast in this episode, some of whom, again, are very bizarre. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Nickleby didn't surprise me because, of course, it's Christmas and there's that clear, you know, Dickens connection and having the the cat. <laughs> 
also made sense because of the Scooby and yeah. the Scrappy thing. But Nanette, Nanette really threw me. She doesn't I mean, really look appropriate for a Scooby Doo episode, does she? She doesn't look appropriate for a winter <laughs> episode. <laughs> And yeah, like there's a serious French maid thing going on there. That is that is a short outfit. Um, yeah, I think I think we mentioned that too when we first watched it. She also has an odd habit where she likes to dust people. Yes. And I enjoyed that as a running gag. I think I enjoyed it more this time. That seemed very Tom Ruger, a bit of a bit of absurdist humor within the episode. Yeah, very much so. Tiny Tina, who is is the tiny Tim analog of the episode. Who had a very small role, and that's that's not no, meant to be a She's precious, though. Um, she has the fantastic line in the episode when Winslow Nickleby offers to buy the orphanage for $5,000, and she just goes, 5000 That's chicken feed! As if this little girl is, like, so into real estate values in the market. That was kind of a thing in the 80s, though, that sassy, smarter-than-they-should-be kid. Right. Well, I mean, right after this... You get the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, which introduces Flim Flam. It certainly does. <laughs> who uh, I am now acquainted with. <laughs> I was warned about, but I was not ready for. I think Flim Flam, I mean, this is getting a little bit off topic, but I think Flim Flam, had he been written differently, had there been a different approach to it, I think they might have been able to pull that mm. character off but even you and amelia commented uh, about the scrappy where it's not so much the character it's the situations exactly. in the writing if, if you were to bring back scrappy do in a modern series people wouldn't like it at first but i if you're really going to put your heart into writing him as a character i think he could work and he was perfectly fine in this episode i mean he didn't do any of the sort of really traditional things that people get annoyed with as far as Scrappy is concerned, he had some awkward <laughs> moments where he was made to be a sugar plum fairy. Yes, but that's actually a running joke in this season where he wants to dress up as something and he gives all these big, tough examples and then he gets dressed as a bunny or a fairy, something cute and cuddly, and then he grumbles about it. And that's a bit that Scrappy does that I enjoyed. I was just going to say, that's something that sounds like it would actually be somewhat entertaining yeah. to watch. Like Because it's like, yeah, you're getting scrappy as this, oh, I'm big and tough guy, but then you're showing that you as the writer understand that that's annoying and you're subverting it. <laughs> like Now, something that I noticed in this episode, which kind of surprised me because we don't really talk about Daphne as, as having a lot of agency until sort of later series, but I very much felt like Daphne was the boss here. Absolutely. She was the leader of the gang in this series. Because you have to remember, if, if Fred's not here, and it was just Shaggy and Scooby-Doo and Daphne, like, Daphne has really stepped up. Um, she's an investigative journalist. She's often the reason why they're going from place to place. And I kind of disagree with a lot of people who said that Daphne didn't have agency in the quote-unquote classic series. Um, because these earlier episodes, they're actually giving her a lot to do. She's also kind of in charge in 13 Ghosts. Yep, exactly. It's it's a, it's similar dynamic. I think ultimately, if you put... You, you could put like a parking meter with Shaggy, Scooby, and Scrappy, and it would be in charge. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But I mean, also, Daphne is a... They all have been around since the beginning. I think Daphne develops a character j just from sheer fact of maybe the writers didn't want her to, but from being around that long, things stick. In this era, Daphne is a journalist. They actually did give careers to both Fred and Velma. Do you, do you know what they did in this period? I, Velma's out of the country, right? No, Velma is working for the United States government at NASA. That sounds very Velma. And Fred <laughs> is running a bookstore of, of mystery books. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's really that... Daphne. So he's like the race dance of the group. <laughs> he is. He's very race dance, which is hilarious because Frank Welker would play race dance in the in the real Ghostbusters. This is true. I forgot about that. So that's actually some perfect dynamism right there. But Daphne is the only one who's stuck with mystery solving because you could say that you know Shaggy and Scooby were the ones we were following, but they weren't solving mysteries in that era. They were surviving. They were bumming around in the mystery machine, eating beans out of a can. <laughs> Daphne was the one who actually wanted to solve mysteries and was curious. And we get that character 
continued into other things. Like, that's who she is in Zombie Island. This is something that I think the the current producers and directors and writers on the Scooby shows have kind of glommed onto. They've realized that, you know, as much as the sort of corporate entity likes to say that Shaggy and Scooby are kind of, that's what you need to push forward and that's what's central. Yeah. Like, there's so much more... The group dynamic is so much more complex. Absolutely. Well, and, that, and that's necessary. the reason why I'm very excited for that Daphne and Velma movie. I just want to see what those characters are like when they're on their own. You know, give give me... Like I've said, I've I've been pushing for a Fred on the Run film for a year. So. <laughs> the Fregative? Yes. Because, actually, it's it's the first episode of this season where Fred is actually accused of the crime and arrested. And I think he does run for a bit, and it just, like, flashed into my head that I really just want to see, like, one series where Fred is on the run from the law and the rest of the gang is trying to clear his name. This is actually the last time we see Fred at this age until... It is. Until, is it Mystery Incorporated? Uh, Zombie Island. Right. So before that. As far as series goes, though. What's new? It'd be what's, what's new? new yeah, what's new Scooby Doo? Yeah, yeah, because a pup he is he is young, and then that is the last series until what's new, isn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's a it's a gap. They have a gap. You know, I I almost Scooby Doo and Doctor Who have a similarity in that way, in that I will look at it as the classic and modern series of it. Except I think the modern series of Scooby Doo, obviously, they've gone with a more segmented approach. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, kind of like a like a, a three seasons and two or three seasons. Eight. Well, I mean, even the, the classic era did that. So Scooby Doo is doing what it's always done, just reinventing itself. That's one of the aspects of the television shows that I love. I mean, there's a part of me that mourns the loss of a show when it ends after two or three seasons, yeah. but it always comes back, and it comes back in a different form. You never know what it's going to be. Sometimes it's familiar, sometimes it's less than familiar, and I think you can sort of put that concept of the show in just about this Daphne and Velma movie. I'm really interested to see it just to see what they do with it. You know, I don't think that this is like, oh, this is canon and this is going to change everything and we're going to have to realign everything we think about Daphne and Velma. This is just a Daphne and Velma take. And yeah. I'm curious, you know, how fun could it be? And it's like, if, if they did a Fred Fugitive show, I would watch that just to see kind of what they did. The Shaggy and Scooby-Doo get a clue. One of the most maligned shows in the uh, entire franchise. And when you actually, like, let go of sort of your preconceived notions and you just sit down and you watch the show and kind of appreciate it for what it is, mm -hmm. it's actually kind of a fun show. I I'm going to say this right now. I haven't seen an episode of it yet, but I guarantee you I've seen worse episodes. <laughs> So I wanted to talk about, uh, I talked about the Bizarre Mishmash. Uh, we've got Nickleby, the Nutcracker, Sugar Plum Fairies, Angels, Pageants, Elves. Oh, how how heartbreaking is it to to right now watch Daphne dressed as an angel? Because as, as we're recording, it's it's like a day after the news broke that Heather North died. It is. I, I was actually going to address the Heather North thing, but I never made that connection with Daphne dressed as an angel. I, I just saw that today, and it, it it's sad. Also, Daphne's the first one to strap on skis and go down a mountain, so that's good for her. <laughs> Fully dressed as an angel, too. I was not expecting a full on Her Majesty's Secret Service <laughs> chase scene. I was thinking Pink Panther, but absolutely. <laughs> it becomes and it's a, a pretty elaborate chase scene. Sequence. They also they have a sleigh that is the same branding as the Mystery Machine. There you go. Yeah. Which And you know, it it also never occurred to me that that was essentially the romp for this episode. Pretty much, yeah. If you were to put I'm in love with an ostrich behind that, it would fit. <laughs> and actually... There's, there's an invitation to anybody out there who's got the time. <laughs> um, speaking of music, I, I don't think I noticed it as much the first time I watched it, but the score of this episode is fantastic. And I think it's partially because everything is so original to the episode. Like when Winslow Nickleby is going over his plan at the beginning, it's like a dark version of We Wish You a Merry Christmas playing in the background. Right. You you get a lot of, of violin this episode. You get a lot of just kind of, I don't know, the, the instrumentation worked very well. Uh, I'm not usually the one who can be eloquent when speaking about that, but it, it stood out to me. Uh, mentioning Nickleby, uh, it takes me back to another thing that I wanted to mention. There's that line when they come in to take the picture of the document, and as they're leaving, 
there's that moment where he's like, you ruined my home. <laughs> <laughs> I almost felt sorry for him. I know, Porky. You know what? The way he reacts at the end of the episode, because uh, his whole thing is that he wants to take over the orphanage to search for this emerald that's a family heirloom. I right. almost think that that air- emerald has more emotional value to him. <laughs> because after he gets it, he's like, oh, and you can have the orphanage. It doesn't matter. Like, I think maybe if you just asked politely to, to rummage around, he would have been okay. That's one of the things I like about this episode is that it, it has those tropes. It has those Christmas things like your Scrooge-like character, your your villainous, I'm going to shut down the orphanage guy. He finds the spirit of Christmas and giving, but they don't play it straight. They, they no. do it with this weird kind of askew... <laughs> Coming at it from a slightly different angle. They do it in a Scooby-Doo way, which is like, it's it's interesting because they really didn't go for parodying A Christmas Carol or The Nutcracker in any direct way. They were just like, all right, let's 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 use this as set dressing to bring the Christmas spirit in, but just do a Scooby-Doo episode. You know, maybe the reason why I'm finding it so bizarre or, or such a weird, like, medley of things is because... I'm going into it with the preconceived notion that this is either going to be a Nutcracker sort of parody or it's going to be a Christmas Carol parody, but they're just taking elements of those things and, like you said, making a Scooby-Doo episode out of it. This is not, you know, a straight, we're taking the Dickens story and we're going to go through it beat by beat. Yeah, you you need to look at it as it exists in the Scooby-Doo universe. Because here here's a question I'm going to ask you. Why do you think they're at this orphanage? Like, as characters... That honestly never occurred to me until uh, I listened to you and Amelia talking about it, and you theorized that perhaps Fred came from this orphanage. Yeah, that that's, that is my theory. There hasn't been anything to contradict it yet. I don't think we've seen direct members of Fred's family. We've seen Shaggy's parents, and we've seen Daphne's parents. But, but It kind of tracks kind in of an alone. interesting way, too, because when you think of, like, where Fred was in uh, Mystery Incorporated... Exactly. It, it parallels. And Scooby-Doo is oddly good at that. I, I've made mention before about how there's a lot of Daphne being used in vampire episodes. And I could talk to you about how Shaggy has often been used in werewolf episodes in a similar way. And why that sort of thematically works, because he's kind of the most mentally weak of the group but they kind of they keep hitting these notes in the same way that repeat over and over again and whether the writers mean to or not it it creates a cohesive story scooby-doo ring theory yeah (laughs) (laughs) they all fold in on each other they start where they end and they end where they start we're running close to time here but i i know you love the gear. I'm curious oh, I, what you think I of love the character models gear. in this episode. Um, if you've listened to Scooby Doo or Scooby Don'ts, you know I get just a little more excited in every episode that I know is going to feature the winter wear because it is consistent, and I think they all just look really great in their winter outfits. Daphne is in the most '60s little like winter dress and fur hat shaggy has this like crazy fur lined collar on his coat fred is normally wearing just a big white parka his parka is very dingy here that was my biggest note on the winter wear today which adds credence to your orphan theory yeah like maybe that was that that's the coat that he got here maybe that was a coat that someone gave him as a gift here i don't know now, but, do you think that you're just reacting positively to a change in the character models because they do have such static looks? Or or are you genuinely, like, really into I, the design I, of the gear? I think I genuinely am, um, because, like, other changes have happened, and, like, I'll mention them on the show, but I'm not as excited as the winter gear. I think because... Oh, it's the winter it's gear like, specifically. It is the winter gear specifically, and I think it's because... They've kept it the same, so even though it is, like, kind of static, it's like, I can believe, like, that's Fred's coat that he's pulled out of the van and put on again. (laughs) Like, you know, Daphne has her hat. I can comment on when they've got a new scarf or something like that. Um, I'm into 13 Ghosts right now, which does a visual change-up of everybody. It's the series when Shaggy, notably, is in a red t-shirt. Daphne has the jumpsuit. She... (laughs) Daphne has a few different outfits, and they're all very 80s, and they're all kind of variations on the jumpsuit. (laughs) 
She has a few jackets, a few robes. I mean, it's hard for her to compete with fashion icon Vincent Price. Oh, yeah. Clearly, he's the best thing about that whole show. Yeah, hands down. I'm so glad they brought him back for uh, Mystery Incorporated, too. Yeah, Vincent Van Gogh, that's a fun character who can stick around, whether you're going to make him like a Fright Night-esque character or actually have him be a mystic living in the Himalayan mountains. What was up with that shaggy laughing moment that goes nowhere when they're hanging off the roof? <laughs> I I don't know. I was I think I was just so impressed with the fact that they did an actual like cliffhanger with them hanging off the that roof. That was just like but... such a weird panic moment that he had and Scoob was like or I can't remember who asks him what's wrong and he's just like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Such an odd choice. You know, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Charles Howell in January. I just might ask him what that was about, if he can remember. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. And and thank him for the ghost of Christmas never. Oh, we never talked because about the ghost. We never talked about the ghost while we were discussing All right, five it. five minutes. I, I love that as a concept. I love the fact that you, we know the ghosts of past, present, and future – Bring in the ghost of Christmas never out of nowhere? Like the fourth point on a compass? That's just... I, I want to believe there was a ghost of Christmas never in the real Christmas carol that never existed, but... That would have that would have been a pretty dark Christmas carol. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost of entropy. Yeah. Yeah, what did you think uh, of but the I... design of the ghost of Christmas never? Well, I mean, it's, it's very based on the ghost of Christmas yet to come, which it, it's, it's very Grim Reaper. Um, I, I do like the fact they went with white instead of black, because I think that looked that looked original and looked really cool in the snow. Don't really get... I don't, there was a green glow around it. There was, yeah. Which I guess is that's just the standard Scooby-Doo ghost glow that they do. But uh, I don't know. I, I guess I could have done without that part. It wasn't the strongest effects animation. <laughs> no. Even for this show. So overall, uh, let's bring this segment to an end. The Nutcracker Scoob. Does it uh, does it pass the do meaning of Christmas test? I think the Nutcracker Scoob is a fantastic example of the do meaning of Christmas. And if if I were to postulate what it means here, it's it's the do meaning of Christmas is the family, how important the gang is to each other, and how much stronger they all are as a team in supporting one another. Fair enough. So there you go. That's our discussion on the Nutcracker Scoob. Thanks so much, Billy, for coming on the show and being our de facto ghost of Christmas past. I, I was very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and happy holidays. Happy holidays to you as well. Happy holidays to Amelia. Give her our best wishes. Yeah, she wishes everyone everyone listening, she wishes all of you and Mike. Well, I, I phrase that weird as if it was only the listeners, but it's you too, Mike. It's every <laughs> I'm not putting words in her mouth. But <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much for having me on. Always a pleasure. Welcome back, dear listener. I hope you enjoyed that look back on a very early episode from Scooby Christmas's past. I thought I might have to pay that mystery in Snickleby a visit myself, but things appear to have worked out nicely in the end. I'm returning to you now in order to give you your second warning. Prepare yourself for when the bell tolls two, you'll be visited by what's with you, Scooby-Doo's Nick Robles. And a very special surprise ghost, guest, host. They will be discussing the season one Be Cool Scooby-Doo episode, Scary Christmas. Until next time! <laughs> Dear. So, you are going to put up the Christmas decorations now, right? No. Just one year, I want it to be about my birthday. But don't you see? I brought us to the ultimate Christmas place to find the ultimate Christmas-related mystery so we can, you know, help orphans bring peace and joy to all mankind by saving Christmas. Thanks, George. Uh, I'll probably have another epiphany in about uh, 15 minutes. See you there. <laughs> you know,
know, sometimes there's a lot of Scooby Doo's out there who will tell you to Scooby Don'ts. And sometimes you gotta take those Scooby Don'ts by the balls and you just gotta tell them to Scooby Doo. That's right. And you know what? Sometimes when you're facing off against something scary, you gotta look that scary thing in the face and you gotta be like, I'm hungry. You gotta start meddling with it. <laughs> Stop meddling. <laughs> We're going to test your metal tonight. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, God damn it, guys. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. That was genius. Somebody get that? <laughs> Welcome to the second segment of the podcast where we are essentially having our second visitation by our ghost of Christmas present. And uh, that ghost is <laughs> that ghost is fellow Scooby Doo podcaster Nick Robes, friend of the show. Nick, welcome to the show. Oh, hey, what's happening, man? Just hanging out here. <laughs> yeah. We no, are... I'm, I'm loving. I'm loving what you've done with the place. It's fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you. I uh, I dolled it up uh, special for you. Very festive. Nick loves it. We are, we're going to be discussing the first season Be Cool Scooby-Doo Christmas episode, Scary Christmas, uh, for yeah. this segment. That was Nick's choice. No, it's not. <laughs> and uh, that episode was directed by Andy Tom, and it was written by John Colton Berry. JCB! JCB! <laughs> Who, uh... <laughs> Who we just happen to have with us here today. Coming down hey. the chimney. John, oh, hey, welcome. Up, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you, Mike. Nick, always a pleasure, my friend. So good yeah. to see you again. It's so good to see you again. <laughs> this is an historic meeting for uh, for John and Nick. They've, they've never met before. That's well, true. We've already, we've already jammed on guitar and sleigh bells. So that's like a that's like there's a brotherhood thing in there now. We're we've connected we've become fast <laughs> friends. Yeah. As long as it's not unspoken between you guys, I'm good with it. <laughs> we literally just spoke. Because if it's unspoken, yeah. then like the rest of this is a wash. So what uh, what we decided to do here is with John's presence, we kind of thought we were going to do this as an audio commentary. Basically, the three of us are going to talk over the episode and use the episode as a focusing tool. <laughs> <laughs> or or so not. we're going to we're going to do the usual thing where we sync up the episode and whatever you you guys are using it's kind of this is this is the christmas gift i guess element part of the show we're going to sneak in a, a commentary very special commentary for you guys and uh you'll just sync up your digital and audio or optical media we'll count down and when we say start you guys start and then we'll chat you're going to be able to hear this VSC coming straight to your ears while you watch a fantastic episode. Let me just tell you about Stamps.com <laughs> first. Uh... <laughs> Have I told you guys how comfortable this Casper mattress is <laughs> that I'm sitting on right now? You know what? I think I might have heard something lately in an audio book from <laughs> Audible.com. You should send me that info via MailChimp. <laughs> Oh, really quickly, I'll have the intern do it that I got on. Oh, I can't even remember what that one is. The oh, hiring. what's what's Mark Marin's big thing with the the food that gets delivered to you? Oh, is he HelloFresh or Blue Apron? Uh, Blue Apron. These are all. Mm. These are the most popular. Um, what do you call them? Sponsors of podcasts, John. Yeah, these oh, are, are the they? sponsors who won't. Yeah, touch my me. goal is to get big enough that I get sent a Casper mattress. That's. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Aren't, aren't podcasts sponsored uh, by the government in Canada? Aren't they subsidized? Isn't it like that's the TV? Why that's why there's officially more podcasters else? than listeners now. <laughs> <laughs> Some Canadian government official is like, ah, damn it, another one? All right, here's here's twenty, here's twenty, two loonies and a toonie. Go get some coffee. <laughs> here's, here's some Timmies and a snowball mic and uh, go take care of it, eh? <laughs> Get her done. Uh, Just give her. Uh, 
So now that I've derailed it. Wait, I mean, I, I forgot. How, how how far down should we put the volume on the actual thing? Pretty far down, right? Otherwise it starts. Yeah, I watched it twice before we started, so I'm just going to have no volume at all. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. I, 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 I really, really, really close captioning. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we could do close captioning, right? I mean, I I, I I wrote it. I pretty much kind of remember it. I don't really need. I, we could, we'll make up all new dialogue, dialogue for it. Let's, that's uh, that's a whole different show. Yeah. Have you have you heard that thing? <clears throat> Apparently, Frank Welker used to do that on stage, where he'd have a TV playing uh, shows, and he would just put it on mute and just do all the show. Like he would just make up all the characters on the spot. Oh, that's so great. There was a show on NBC. <laughs> This was like mid 80s and it was called Mad Movies and they basically it was a late night show it, it was like before or after Friday night videos and they had these three or four comedians who would play old movies and they would replace all the dialogue for the old movies and it was actually pretty funny. Well he's it was funny basically, it was funny to me it's like the was update just, of uh, uh Fractured Fairy Tales. Or or or, or what's up Tiger Lily? I mean Woody Allen did that with that whole yeah. movie. He, yeah. he replaced all the dialogue. Yeah, Fractured Flicks. That's what I was thinking of the Jay Ward production. I'm oh, not familiar with Fractured, fractured Flicks. Fractured oh, it, fairy Tales, I remember. Yeah, Fractured Flicks. It was like a. a it would be like Paul Freese and Bill. Uh, what's his name? Uh, and all of them. And it was a Jay Ward production where they would do like B movies and replace all the dialogue. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Did I just out nerd Mike Josic? Yes. Points. <laughs> all right. So. <laughs> Well played, <laughs> literally. So uh, I was going right. to ask so, if anybody had any kind of preamble. John, do you want to introduce the episode before we start? Uh, yeah, so we're doing Scary Christmas, right? That's correct. This was this was the uh, first uh, Christmas special that our, the, our first Christmas episode. I had done a very big Christmas special for Phineas and Ferb, and with that one, humble brag. There was there was well, no, no. I'm saying I'm saying that that <laughs> the point. The point of that was, is there a reason, a purpose to do a Christmas special? Like, everyone has got a Christmas special. This is, and, this is and, a question uh, I asked myself this past week. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a valid question. And my feeling was, my partner, Piero Peluso, our feeling was, if we are going to do this, like, the original idea that was being, was like a kind of a Grinch parody thing, and we're like, no, we really sincerely have got really have to try to do something that means something to this generation the way Charlie Brown and Grinch and those meant to us growing up. We really, really should be trying to compete in that arena and not just do a cheap, oh, everyone does a Christmas special, but do something that only Phineas and Ferb could do, do a special that only that show can do, that says something new, that does something different, that has a purpose, otherwise it's not worth doing. Then we're it's just a cheap, you know, oh, we're doing a Christmas special. And and so we actually worked really, really hard on finding, an, you know, a, 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 an original story and something. The, the whole idea of thanking Santa Claus, which, which was a kind of a really nice message. Everyone writes letters to Santa saying what they want, but no one writes a thank you note afterwards to say, wow, look what thank you. You gave everyone, look what you did. This is the coolest thing. You're so nice, you know. And we just thought yeah. it had a nice message, you know. And so when it came around to this one, and it was like, all right, a Christmas show again. You know, I, I almost went in the opposite direction and tried to think of, all right, how can I do sort of an anti-Christmas special? And so, so that was that was sort of the genesis of the story idea was that Fred wants so badly to be in a Christmas special and, and solve a Christmas-related mystery, but just the, the, the roll of the dice, he, he didn't get one. You know, he, got, he has a pterodactyl instead of like a, a, you know, a Santa monster or, you know, something. So he's hoping for something. He wants to save orphans and kittens and bring, you know, men of different races and creeds together. But <laughs> okay. no, he's got a dinosaur. Can I, so so that was that was a question that I have about this. The, the, uh -huh. the idea of like the orphanage, the kittens, the like, I almost feel like... Uh, like watching this episode, it almost felt like there was a whiteboard of like, all right, what are the top seven Christmas things that we need to do? That was like half the whiteboard. And then the other half of the whiteboard was like, what are the opposites of those things? Like, how do we how do we not, like like how do we balance that with like the opposite? And it's like, OK, pterodactyl. It, uh. it was like a color wheel, but with Christmas story points. 
<laughs> I sort of. I mean, that the whiteboard was sort of in my head, but but yeah. I mean, it was it, it was. It, it, there's a strange sort of obvious math to it when you think about it. You know, Christmas special. What's the opposite? A pterodactyl. <laughs> if you if you actually, I, I didn't show my work there, but but it, you know, if you look at the margins, you'll see mathematically it's it's perfect. Bear in mind, Nick, if if they were going to be putting this on a whiteboard, Warner Brothers would have had to have supplied them with one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sick burn. <laughs> no, yeah, I had to write on Zach's back with a pen. It was very sad. But Tom was telling me that at one point they had moved him into the office with the in betweeners. Yes. Which yes. like nothing, yeah, nothing you were in against in-betweeners, but no, no, he was supposed to be my my writer's room. I, I begged for a writer's room, and they gave me Tom, which which Tom is you know that he's he is he is the equivalent of four brilliant writers. Uh, you know, Tom is, is is an amazing comedy writer and a wonderful guy. But then that they put him in this weird back dark office with with a whole bunch of artists. So he's like in this not very conducive for comedy writing place. And then they they gave us a whole bunch of extra like, oh, we need a, a Halloween special, and another Christmas special on top of our schedule already. So we never actually got to work as a writer's room. We we're suddenly inundated with all of these things that we had to do and we were working separately and, and, and but I'd walk by and Tom would be reading a script to the in-betweeners the artists would be sitting there laughing trying to draw and Tom would be trying out all his stuff on them it was not his ideal, own personal but, open mic <laughs> it really was yeah it was really his own he got to test everything out uh, hey we got a great looking crowd here today uh, uh, you guys ever think about uh... <laughs> well your dog won't stop eating I mean you know am I right <laughs> And the crowd goes mild. <laughs> My favorite. Uh, the best open mic host line ever. Do you guys mind if I take us into the episode? Uh, let's <laughs> go. Right. Yeah. Tell me when. All right, so with that introduction as a, a, a great introduction, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go into the... Oh, yeah, what are we... Oh, yeah. Scary Christmas, all right. I remember we're going to go into uh, what, Scary what we're Christmas here. So when all I right. count... Did you just say Gary Christmas? Scary Christmas. <laughs> it's not a SpongeBob podcast, Nick. <laughs> oh, it's... By, by the way, really not terribly proud of the title. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's, it's about as lazy as... Uh, besides our Halloween episode called Halloween, I would say that... it's a little on the nose? Scary Christmas, it was just about as... as the original, I found my original script. I actually, I did a little research for this. I went back and looked to see if there was some major, anything interesting I could bring up. There isn't <laughs> anything interesting. No. But, but the original title of it was Not a Christmas Special, which ah. I actually think would have been a better title it for been. it. Um, I would agree. Uh, I should have, should have can I ask that. a nerd question? Yes. No. Do you, do you write uh, animation scripts on like Final Draft or a Google Doc? Like, what do you do? Uh, I, I usually use Final Draft. Oh, okay. Right on. Yeah. Asked and answered. Time, time to put your whiteboard away there, Nick. <laughs> oh, I use Highland? Please. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, well, Final Draft or Zach's back. Either one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see you <laughs> erasing things. <laughs> no, you don't erase. You scratch out. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of space there. It gives a whole new context. We got seven more scripts to figure out. I'm going down yeah. your thigh. <laughs> no, Turn yeah, around. I, I got to do an outline. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to count. Yeah. No, he's like Memento. <laughs> We're chasing him around trying to get the season. Now. Oh, my God. That would have been an incredible Be Cool episode. <laughs> a yeah. Memento episode in Be Cool. Who would we you want... tattoo it on, though? Scooby. Shave him. Genius. That's that's why he's I the writer. Shave too. We we wanted to do so many more. I mean, like the second one we did, the the uh, Scrooge Do one, was you know Warner Brothers starting started to allow us to push the envelope and try weird stuff. And this was this idea of taking classic horror literature or mystery literature, like like a Christmas Carol or or, or Frankenstein or Bram Stoker's Dracula, taking all these classic things and destroying them by turning them into Scooby Doo mysteries. So the ghost were really people wearing disguises and Frankenstein was a guy in a mask and we wanted to do that with all of the classic literature and 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 um it was such a to me it's such a fun idea 
like because at the end of Scrooge, you do like it's a spoiler alert, you know. But um, <laughs> Scrooge, Scrooge ends For up when we get to see it in thirty-two and yeah, a half yeah, years. Yeah, Scrooge ends up because it turned out to not be real ghosts. He ends up not having to change, so he doesn't help the little boy, and and people die, and and the world is much worse off because the Scooby Gang solved the mystery. You know, <laughs> and we so we basically destroyed you know people's lives, and 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 that was fun. So we want to do <laughs> Really, just everybody felt better about themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were excited to destroy Victorian people's lives. <laughs> You're doing the naked gun of Scooby Doo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. All right. So, All right. We start, uh, give us the Very countdown. Good. All right. Everybody's got their episodes ready. Ready okay. to go when you are, sir. Okay. Gonna count down from three, and when I say play, everybody hit play. So it's three, two, one, go. Three, two, one, go. Yeah. Don't okay. do the bit where it's go on one or <laughs> go on go. Yeah, well, that's the bit I was doing. <laughs> I did the bit. I know you, Nick. All right, three, two, one, play. And here we are. Yeah. So this is this is uh this was the third or fourth attempt. These cold opens were the hardest part of the entire show. We we rewrote. Every episode, we went through five or six different, completely different ones because they were just so hard to come in and try to come up with a funny little bit and a funny little sketch. Uh, who who the came first up? One was about a <clears throat> John. Who came up with like all of the, all this math? <laughs> I did. This is you, yeah. I, I you wrote, researched. I wrote it? all this. Uh, yeah, I pretty much the the. The numbers he says are accurate. I love that he's <laughs> fireproof. Good to know. <laughs> well, okay, or, so or, or they're not, but prove me wrong. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I try. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. I'm, I'm going to say they're accurate. Hey, here's here's one thing that I was thinking of uh, recently. The the pacing of Be Cool Scooby Doo is something that we've never seen in a Scooby Doo franchise ever. Like it is unbelievably. I mean, what feels to me very modern that the the idea of the like uh, the kids saying the math for what what feels like forty five seconds and then just like beat, he's fireproof. Like that that pacing to me typifies a lot of what I feel about Be Cool Scooby-Doo. It's like a very... There's a push and pull to it that I've never seen in this franchise before. It has amazing it comic timing. Ve- it was very, very, very difficult to get there. The actors, you know, had been doing these... Frank Welker, particular, forever he's been doing Fred. He, he owns that character. They're very proprietors of these characters. They feel they know them. And we changed them a lot. You know, I, Mike, no, I talked about Fred is Gene Wilder from, from Young Frankenstein. That's who I'm writing when I'm writing Fred. And through the alchemy of the animation and Frank's voice, it comes out as this particular Fred here. But, you know, um, but my dialogue is meant to be read very quickly. It's supposed to be very fast, fast, fast. And, and the actors tend to want to, you know, take their time and have fun with it. And so every time it was like faster, faster, faster. And it felt unnatural to them, but eventually they got up to speed. But yeah, the pacing and the speed at which they're talking um, ends up. It, it, I don't know if it sounds like they're talking fast to you guys. Oh yeah, it, it moves at a pretty it, good clip. It, in in a good right, way. Right, but but that's sort of it's what it needs to be for it really to work. Well, for this humor. Yeah, for this humor, John. I wanted to. I would also say. <laughs> you, oh, sorry. I just Go wanted ahead. to ask John. One of the things I find the most interesting about this episode is everyone is kind of working at cross purposes and I think it really works narratively. And it's one of my favorite things about this show when all of the characters kind of have their own agendas. I was wondering why that approach was uh, developed. Uh, Well, again, just because we we were trying to do a comedic ensemble. So all the characters, I'm going to use the word math a lot because it it very much is to me. It's algebra. The characters are built to have conflicts and contrasts and complements with with one another. So Fred's a control freak. If the other characters are being funny, it means they're out of control, which means Fred is funny, trying to get them back into control. 
You know, Daphne is very open-minded and, and she's more Mulder and Velma is more Scully and she's more of the skeptic and she, you know, and so, so they're, they're, they're built in ways that to create comedy and conflict at all times. Uh, your background, I, I'm sorry, uh, your Wikipedia page is scant, so I'm, I'm inferring from your IMDB page. You, you come from Second City, right? Uh, sketch writing? Uh, no, no, but, but I, uh, I, I did do a lot of sketch writing, a lot of stage comedy writing, and I did do some work with Second City, uh, but I wasn't really in Second City. The, the thing that really reads to me is that it is, it is very focused in the way that like a sketch needs to be. It's like we have information that we need to get across so that we can make sure that we can now play with it. And that that fast clip, that pacing that I'm talking about, I mean, uh, I don't know if everybody else is at the orphanage right now, but it's one of my yeah. favorite pieces of all time in this episode. <laughs> it's, so, it's so awful. It's just so sad. I didn't even know they were going to do with the pushing his nose against it. It was much, it was much more, it was even more than I even thought. But I was like, oh, I'm so glad they made it even worse than I imagined. Well, can I also also that like it's so funny that that gag feels so modern to me because like it is it it feels like a, you know, like a a modern cartoon gag of like but old school Scooby Doo, if they had known that they could do that, they would have been creaming in their pants because so much of old Scooby Doo is like is like, uh, uh, oh, Scooby Doo thinks that his tail is a worm. Oh, how long is that going to go on for? Ten seconds. Let's see if we can push it for a minute. (laughs) Right. Like, just being able to stop and look at this kid would have been a blessing to old school Scooby-Doo. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, again, that was the part of the, the thinking was to go back to the original Scooby-Doo, where are you? And make the show, if they were going to make that show today, what would that show be? We went back to mm. that same paradigm. Those five characters in the van drive around solving mysteries. How would we do that today? You know, kind of using our sensibility and my particular sensibility is very pre 1980s comedy, very sketch comedy. Marx Brothers, uh, Monty Python, early Woody Allen, very early Mel Brooks. Um, a little uh, bit of SCTV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but uh, there's a, there is a lot of sketch in there, and mm. and a lot of those people like Woody Allen and Mel Brooks and Monty Python. Um, they're, they're particularly their early films. Each scene is almost a sketch. They 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 build their movies with with uh, almost uh, uh, self-contained sketches, you know, yeah. and, and they got better and better at blending. Holy Grail is really sketches, and there's almost barely any linking. By Life of Brian, it's a much more fluid narrative film, even though there's still sketch-like scenes, you know. And you'll find the same with early Woody Allen and Mel Brooks, who wrote your show shows. They wrote sketch. All those people come from a sketch place. And and, mm. and 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 that thinking always goes into usually everything I write, that I try to have each scene have a beginning and a middle and end and sort of a comedic point of view as a sketch. So there is that there. And almost A, B stories for each scene. I mean, each scene almost has its own A, B of the sketch where it's like, oh, this is happening primarily, but also this is the, this is the secondary story that's happening. I mean, yeah. I don't know if everybody else is seeing her scr- spray him right now with Silly String, but still, yeah. like, her birthday is this B story. <laughs> There's a lot to service. Yeah, it, it was it, it was tough getting everything in there, you know. But 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 th- again, that's something it had to be read fast. Was was there's a lot to accomplish, um, but that's what sort of made it fun and made it th- that this particular gang is that they all have their own agendas, but you can sort of feel their love and their friendship and their you know, um, uh. You know, it serves a larger purpose. Yes, it does serve yeah. a larger purpose. I think this episode is particularly good for exemplifying what you said about it being math because there's so much going on and so much needs to be accomplished. And this is the third time I'm seeing this episode tonight. And it's interesting how every time I see it, I see the layers and I can see how you're basically putting everything in and making sure that everything is introduced at a certain time so that you know, it builds to something that, you know, you get the payoff in the end. And it's something that you guys did all the time on this show. And it's these really, really crazy episodes where you're really pushing sort of the 
the boundaries of what the show could do where, where that's most notable. But I just like hats off to you guys for doing that. Cause it, it really works. Oh, well, th- thanks. Well, this, this one also had that particular problem of, I had to have that ending where it, you know, like I, I had to place in all the elements so at the end they turn into Santa in a sled. Yeah, like there's no way you know what I mean? that you're watching Scooby and Shaggy on this treadmill. There's no way you could know right. how that's going to pay off later. It's just this weird. Well, right. that's the thing, right? Don't so, telegraph it somehow, but also have it like be organic so that it's not yeah, uh, ham that, that, that was the hard, the hard part of this was bringing yeah. all. The, but, but you know what? Honestly, I think the mystery suffered a little bit all the surfacing we had to do for the characters it is a fairly complicated mystery there's a lot of like and then i did this and he had to do this and, and it's sort of like well mm. where where did this come from? like i'm not i don't think it's really our best mystery and our best suspects i think i think but every episode has to have a mystery but that doesn't mean that every episode's focus has to be the mystery no and and i preferred I, I didn't. I, I didn't really think people cared that much about the mysteries per se. You got a pterodactyl there. Like, what, what else do you need? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, but here's like... the other thing. I mean, uh, from from an artistic standpoint, like, if you're going to be writing this, there is going to be an element. If you are a, 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 a conscientious person, which you are, there's going to be an element where you want everything to be perfect. You want the yeah. mystery to be perfect. You want the characters, the characters to be perfect, That's the gags it. to be perfect. You want it all to balance out. So I, I, yeah. I get that. I get that idea. Do you think there's an episode where you got it all right? Not all uh, right. I know that a lot of people are going to be thinking that in this nation right now, but all right. <laughs> uh, you know what? I think some thread time got pretty close i think that that one was was the first uh, first episode of season two um did a pretty good job of of having good suspects an interesting mystery like you, you weren't really sure what's going on some surprises um funny moments i think i think uh i think the 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 the, the latter part the last four or five episodes of season one and the first uh, half of season two uh, was our best work, sort of where we were we were we were getting as close as we could to doing the show as best as we could. Mm. By the way, that was my favorite gag of this entire episode the the bicycle thing. I actually I also wanted to just jump in and say I love how joyously exuberant Shaggy and Scooby are in this episode. Like they're so happy through the whole thing. <laughs> Also, well, them that. doing the sack race at the beginning, like completely right. independent of the rest of the gang, it's great. It's great background business. Um, a lot of people felt that Daphne was being very whiny about her birthday in this one, and and it's it's. Those are people who don't have birthdays on uh, December twenty fourth. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought it was a fairly, you know, like because I know some people who actually have that problem. Um, some stuff was cut that was that was very very silly that lightened up Daphne. She didn't seem quite as whiny, um, but uh, but still, you know, I, I think it's okay if 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 Daph- Daphne's thing isn't always goofy. If if it's you know a little bit more, you but know, you could also make the argument that Velma is being like super naggy too because Fred's just trying to find a Christmas mystery and, and Velma's like really putting him down through the whole episode. And by oh, yeah. that account, you could say Fred's very whiny. So to pick, I think to pick on one character is just unfair. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, I just heard her say, Worst Worst birthday, birthday ever! Birthday ever! <laughs> oh, great. That's one of those moments so where you're like, why series. aren't they still hanging on right? that scene? And then you hear, you hear Gray give that delivery, and it's like, perfect. Gray, Gray is is just so brilliant, and she is so much like like this Daphne. It was just mm. it was a piece of cake for her. She instantly got what we were doing with this. And Kate, Kate was perfect too. She she was it, she we we actually made Velma more like Kate than we originally intended because she uh. has such a natural, vulnerable sort of you know thing about Vibe. her. Yeah, yeah, that that it sort of took took on Velma. Yeah. 
but yeah, uh, to plug like my wrong. buddy, to plug my buddy's podcast, uh, Gray was just on Comedy on Vinyl, and uh, I, I think she is one of the most charismatic people I have ever heard on that podcast. She's so great. I moderated oh, a panel really... for her at a uh, at a convention once, and yeah, she's she's a force of nature. She's she's doing stand up now. <laughs> um, I I keep meaning to go see her. Have you seen? Have you seen on Facebook? She's been posting it. She's been doing stand up. Uh, she's going to be at the Comedy Store in January, I believe. I'm still staggered by the idea that Frank Welker has a comedy album. Does he? What? Are you talking about Almost Sold Out? You haven't heard No, it? you mentioned that the last time we talked on the show, oh, and I, we were like, so what? Good. So good. He does... He literally does two sides of impressions, and it's amazing the whole time. I think we should also point out, I mean, we're talking so much about the writing because obviously John, but not only is, is the writing and the story busy, but just look at this episode. Like there's so much design in this episode. I mean, the characters have new models. It's a beautiful episode. Yeah. It's the, Mm -hmm. the, you know, the town, the, usually you've got your stuff that, you know, every new thing that gets introduced, whatever, but the characters are always on model and. And here, you know, they got the winter gear. Billy would probably be very happy right now. <laughs> Can I also ask a question? No. Great. All right, let's move on. <laughs> no, please. <laughs> please, please. Uh, so the no, the, fi- the fifteen minutes was that supposed uh-huh. to be fifteen minutes into the episode or fifteen minutes after he previously said, "I'm going to need you at fifteen minutes." Well, it's 15 minutes um, and 35 seconds into the episode, Nick, so you tell me. Into the episode, he's, <laughs> it, it happens 15 minutes, but it doesn't happen 15 minutes after he says, I'll need it in 15 minutes. You know what? I, I, I don't know. It was, I, it was probably just a joke and not really actually planning it out that, it, that he'd, 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 he'd have another epiphany exactly at that time. Acceptable. Um, but, but, but. <laughs> But now I'm kicking myself for not paying attention to that because normally that is the, thing, the type of stuff I'm anal about. Can I ask you to retract that and just say that you wanted it to happen at 15 minutes into the episode? I retract that. I wanted it to happen at 15 minutes into the episode, but they Thank stopped you. me. <laughs> <laughs> Where did George come from, John? It's, it was such an out-of-left-field thing. Where did George yeah, isn't George the guy that shines the light on Fred? Oh, oh, oh! You mean oh yeah, the the epiphany yeah. guy. Uh, I, I it was just it was just a really silly idea that Fred keeps having these epiphanies and that he's hired this guy to high, to enhance his epiphanies. I, I it was just it's just an absurdist sort of, sort of idea. It was I don't know where any of this stuff comes from. How much do you think Fred is paying him? Wait, nope, nope, hold on. Mike, first. How much do you think Fred is paying him? It was a single bill, so I'm going to say a fiver. <laughs> uh, John, how much is Fred paying him? I think Fred solved the mystery for him. And so oh. George owes him. So George, so George is, is the one who brought him into this. I, no, I think Fred once helped George out on a mystery. And mm. as as payment, he's not, he, George regrets it. He, he regrets agreeing to this. But Fred's like, look, I, I'm going to have some epiphanies coming up. And I, I could use some help. And he's like, all right, I, I've, I've, lit, <laughs> I've lit some epiphanies before. I have some experience in this. So, yeah, you know, but he didn't expect so many epiphanies. You know, so I think I think it was it it was a uh, it was a uh, you know an 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 obligation on George's the part. The story that John is mm. spinning, I smell a direct to video movie here. <laughs> the origin say, of, it's better than a lot of them. Uh, yeah, but this whole thing trying to make it come together and then ah. Oh, so that. Yeah. Yep. It's funny. I mean, like when the when the presents go into the bags, you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> right. I do like how satisfyingly. You know, almost sickeningly Christmas, this this all ends up in the end. <laughs> well, it's subversively saccharine, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at that. Ah! You're popping. It's just it's ridiculous. 
Oh, and he's got the beard. Scooby's got the nose. Yeah. Yeah, and in that scene, that but, one scene alone, you can basically see kind of all the all the setup for the last 18 minutes kind of paying off. Yeah. Mm. I did want to ask, we're coming up to the, the finale where they all sing Happy Birthday to Daphne. And they sing Happy Birthday, uh-huh. Daphne, to Hark the Herald Angels Sing, which is how the Charlie Brown because Christmas sing special Happy ended. At the time. Wait, is what? That, yeah, at the end of the Charlie Brown Christmas special, they all sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing around the Christmas tree. Was that intentional, John? Uh, it was not It was not intentional. Uh, I just had to use a public domain Christmas song. So uh, <laughs> so I chose one that... that that the lyrics of "Happy Birthday, Daphne," "Happy Birthday" that would work would work the best with with the scan. Yeah, so it was basically trying to save money and uh, use one that scanned the best with the with the lyric. Um, well or or no, yes, I purposefully was homaging Charlie Brown. <laughs> This is our entire project I'm, I'm, right I'm, now. I'm, answer, I'm answering everything wrong. I, you are really screwing up absolutely yeah, everything. Uh, I, I really, I really, I yeah. I will, I will make myself look much more clever in my next response. I promise. <laughs> uh, that's such a modern kid too. <laughs> and this, and this kid's name is wow. Blake, but. This kid's name is Brayden, and it, I tried in every episode where there's a kid to have him named Brayden. <laughs> in, 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 in the coward episode, I tried your coward the duck at the beginning. I don't know if you saw that one. <laughs> He's like coward the like, duck. No, no, no. Well, no, no. how to train your coward? There's a there's oh. a duck, a, a guy in a duck outfit, a singing duck. Oh, the opening scene, yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah, the opening scene, but he's like. Maurice, I'm in the wrong. I'm in. I found the only house in America without a kid named Braden in it. It's a <laughs> weird running running joke just for me and my wife because when we <laughs> named our child, you know, Braden, Aiden, Jaden, those were the names that were the most popular, you know. And it's just like there's a million Bradens now. Yeah, Nick, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll hook you up later. All right, good. <laughs> uh, we won't let the uh, the the powers that be know. Um, Good thing we're not recording this. Right? All right, so we're coming up to the conclusion of the episode. John, any closing comments? Uh, I was very pleased with this. I, I thought it was a, I thought it was a, a, a nice, subversive uh, little Scooby-Doo episode and uh, uh, fulfilled its sort of anti-Christmas special, you know, uh, vibe I was trying to go for, yet still felt Christmassy and, and uh, was the correct tone for this particular series. I, I was, I was good with this one. Nick, your thoughts? Anti Christmas, Christmas special. Uh, well, I mean, I, I feel like it, it very, it, I mean, I talked about the micro pacing of it joke wise, but also the macro pacing of it, like that sort of anti Christmas, Christmas special idea, you know, just it all getting summed up with, uh, uh, Fred uh, at the beginning of Act Three, right, being like, "My stubborn search for a Christmas mystery ruined Christmas for this town." Wait, hold on, I can solve everything. Like it was that it, it, it wore its heart on its sleeve, but it wasn't uh, it, it it wasn't uh, overly saccharine. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like I, I think that was I think it was well balanced. I think that's that's. Ultimately, sort of the charm of Be Cool Scooby-Doo is that it does have the gags. It's a very gag-heavy show. Some of them are very sophisticated in the timing and the, and the execution, but it was a show. It's a really mm-hmm. sentimental show. It wears its heart on its sleeve, like you said, and, and it honors the original series. And I think that combination of stuff is, is what's why I keep saying to you guys, like, time is going to be kind to this thing. Oh, well, thanks. I, I, I pretty much agree. I, you know, I, I think... I know yeah, I'm preaching to the choir, it, so... <laughs> No, it, it, uh, it, it is, it, it's a show about five friends, you know, and I, and I think that the, you know, staying away from the romantic relationship stuff that Mr. Incorporated did was very useful just in terms of mm. creating believable dimensional human beings who are spending a lot of time together and they behave the way 
friends really do. They bitch at each other sometimes, but we you know that they have each other's back. And, and so there, there's a lot of very honest, true, emotional sort of stuff in it. So it does wear its heart on its sleeve, but it's also a very irreverent, you know, sort of silly comedy. There's um, also... Well, it's funny that you mentioned it's an irreverent, silly comedy because it's it, – so if you take the original series, 1960s, they want to make you know this, this idea of these, these teenagers that solve mysteries. Great. There's not a lot of stakes to that in the 60s. There's not – like it, it hasn't been done 175 times before. So right. now once you get to Mystery Incorporated – the idea of trying to take that and make it relevant to a larger audience, take it seriously, the most obvious way to do that is to take these relationships seriously, to make it more adult, to make it to make everything uh, to, to up the ante when it comes to uh, interpersonal relationships, uh, death, uh, 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 you know, all these all these adult themes. What you did uh is take it in the complete opposite direction. How do we make this relevant to a modern audience? We're going to make it we're we're actually going to make an adult series in the least obvious way possible. We're we're, we're going to take everything and we're going to actually make a uh, smart subversive gags. We're going to make it uh we're, we're, when when you say go left, we're going to go right. And I think that that that, that was a great call. And that's why I think that uh, it's going to be uh, viewed favorably in the future to parent Mike. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank you. If yeah, if if, if anyone in the future welcome. is is able to uh, to to see it, it would be it would be very very heartening if it is looked back on as the the little Scooby Doo show that that could have you know that that people didn't pay much attention to but hey go back and give it a shot on DVD because you really missed out on a cute little you know my 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 bar has lowered in terms of of what I what what I had hoped for with the show um, mm. I'm not really aiming for an Emmy at this point um, <laughs> but but you know. <laughs> Two, two more, two more fans who really like it. I, that's a win for me. I'm, I am with that. You know, um, I will. Uh, I'm thrilled with every every new person who uh, who will write me and say, you know, I watched this with my kids and we both sat there and we laughed mm -hmm. and this was the, we this we love the show. Thank you. Like I think that's honestly. I said I watched this episode three times this evening, uh, uh, twice in preparation and once while we were watching it just now. I laughed every time. It wasn't like I knew the joke was coming, so it wasn't funny. Mm. Every time the silly string gets sprayed or Shaggy uh, and Scooby, that or, goddamn orphan, the orphan. I know you just can't. I saw yeah, you oh. laughing on the webcam. You just couldn't stop. Oh. <laughs> and I think that that's... orphan is such a good yeah. gag. That's a storyboard artist bit, right? Uh, yeah, I mean it was in the script, but but the but the milking of it and Jake's music, the the, the sad, you know, like the the patheticness of the whole thing. This poor child wants to be adopted, and he thinks these people have come to, you know, and it's like no, they're just, you know, it's just so sad. It's awful, isn't it? Called Big Sad Eyed Orphanage. Big Sad Eyed yeah. Orphanage. Is that what? Is that That's what, what it was called. It, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's Big Sad Eyed Orphanage. <laughs> This is so awful. <laughs> I've seen a, I've seen a lot of animated Christmas specials. Some of them have been great. Most of them haven't. You're talking about the Will Vinton uh, uh, claymation. <laughs> and have, have you guys have you guys seen? I'm sorry, I started to interrupt. Have you guys seen the little drummer boy claymation one? The the yeah, years ago. That's a rank and bass. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I, in preparation for the Finnish and Ferb one, my part Piero and I, we watched a whole bunch of them, and we watched that one, and we were, our jaws were on the floor at the, like, it was so dark and so not kid-friendly, like, like, like the father is killed, and the bad guys burst in, and the mother turns and looks and has almost these, like, like they're going to, like, sexually abuse her, like, 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 it was really, like, Oh my God! It, it was dark and 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 terrifying and and I I, I I can't believe that that that's what we were watching when we were kids. Kids used yeah, to be able a to lot handle of those way are more. Weird. Weird. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I mean, even I'm, like I'm, a year without a Santa Claus, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Rudolph, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. That one was terrible. Santa, they were shunning, like like they were mad. Don't, don't let him come out with his red nose. 
like Santa was being a complete prick to this little poor little reindeer with who was a deformity. And he's and he's and and they're shaming him, and only because he can help. Finally, do they love him? Not because yeah, they, of who he is, only because he has utility. Like, what kind of lesson is that? <laughs> it's awful. Unless you're useful, if you're different, you should stay hidden away. Yeah, I feel like that was a year without a Santa Claus as well. Like the town that like isn't going to have Christmas because heat miser is like uh, 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 making it hot, and like snow miser isn't going to compromise with them. I mean, it was it was all like these weird political messages that weren't they they were apolitical for the time. I mean, it's bunkers. Right. Yeah, yeah, it was just some weird, weird, weird stuff. Um, so I'm so sorry, Mike. I was interrupting you. Oh, no, mid, it's fine. Uh... And then I continued the interruption. You are guests in my home here. I was just going to say that, you know, I've seen a lot of animated specials. Some of them are good. Most of them aren't. And when Be Cool Scooby-Doo was playing and I was watching it and I knew there was a Christmas episode coming up, I was just kind of crossing my fingers that this was going to be a drop the ball sort of moment. And Scary Christmas, when that pterodactyl showed up, I was like, I'm in. I'm all in, and it didn't disappoint. You guys have mm-hmm. added to the, the pantheon of of subversive classic Christmas specials. <laughs> oh well, thank yeah. you very much. I'm 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 glad that we uh, we delivered. I try not to just continually stroke your ego while you're here, John, but sometimes it's hard. <laughs> no, no, please be my. I, no, I, I I'm 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 totally fine with it. That's why Nick's yeah, it's here. funny you Nick should bring that. Yeah, it's funny you should bring that up. Uh, why the hell did the guy give uh, Daphne a magnifying glass? Uh, also, why is it an archaeological dig if they are finding uh, uh, dinosaur remnants? Shouldn't that be a paleontology paleontological gig? <laughs> yes, it 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 should be, but it started <laughs> off as an archaeological dig, and then they, they found, found dinosaur remnants. dinosaur eggs and brought in a paleontologist. Okay, uh, cards on the table. My girlfriend was the one who said that, and I gave the exact same answer that you gave. (laughs) That's because you're a genius. (laughs) What can I say? There you go, Nick. You can retire on that one. Fantastic. I'm going to make t-shirts that say, that's because you're a genius, John Colton Barry. That's because you're a genius. There you go. Um, Yeah, with the bells. (laughs) Thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Of course. Hey, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for uh, for continuing to uh, shine a little light on on Be Cool. It is appreciated. All right. So with that, we'll bring uh, this segment to a close. That was our discussion slash audio commentary for Scary Christmas. <laughs> Uh, I just want to once again thank my guests for uh, this segment, my Ghosts of Christmas present, Nick Robes from uh, What's With You, Scooby-Doo. This has been a blast. Thank you so much for having me, sir. And, of course, the incomparable John Colton Berry. I am incomparable. Thank you so much, guys. So be, stick with us for segment Come three, which will be people. coming shortly. And these two guys will play you out. <laughs> All right, hit me, hit me. Merry hit. Christmas, wherever you roam. He hit me with some sleigh bells. A podcast named Scooby-Doo. I am John Colton. Who? Uh, um, Merry Christmas, everybody. Is this where we sing Merry Christmas to everyone? Or just closing out? Um, that was a little chaotic for my liking. I don't know what an audio commentary is. But it seems suitably informative, and if you, good listener, took anything of value away from that jumble, then I guess we're good. Now, I am here to prepare you for your third and final visitation of Luke and Evan of the Scooby Dudes podcast, who will be discussing the Scooby episode of Christmas yet to be Scrooge Do. That name rings a bell. Beautifully written. And speaking of bells, wait until the tolling of the three and know that it tolls for thee.
Cratchit. Scrooge! Tis I, Jacob Marley, your great business partner, returned from the great beyond with a message. You shall be visited by three... Bop, bop, bop. What? You don't knock? I know we were partners and you've been dead these past seven years, but there's still such a thing as manners. Manners? I'm a ghost. We don't knock. We just appear. We, we show up. Oh, you show up unannounced, do you? They don't teach you to give fair warning in the afterlife? No, they do, which is why I'm here to give you this warning. You shall be visited by three ghosts. Oh, so there's three more of you coming. Will they have the decency to let me know before they arrive? That's what I'm trying to do. Well, get on with it, then. You shall be visited by three ghosts. Yes, we've covered that already. And? And they will attempt to save you from your miserly ways. Oh, so I'm miserly now. We're going to add name-calling to the list of unpleasantries. Allow me to recap. You show up at my office unannounced, you're bringing three uninvited guests, and you've resorted to petty insults. Pray tell what intrusive action I'd be expecting next. Hmm? So here we are in our third segment, welcoming for the first time to a podcast named Scooby-Doo, the Scooby Dudes. Welcome, guys. Ooh, thank you for having us. <laughs> That's right, you heard it. We're obviously the ghosts of Xmas yet to come. Luke, we're, we're the ghosts of yet two bees. <laughs> yet two bees? I was, yeah. I was trying to figure out what Evan was doing, now I know. <laughs> I can't believe you weren't. I thought we were a team. I thought we were we were in this together. I now want to be Mike's co-host. Mike, will you have me? <laughs> we I can mean, talk. You are the ghost. You are the ghost of Christmas yet to come, yet to be. Okay. And Luke is the ghost of Christmas yet to come. I'm just Mike's pot. I'll be your intern, Mike. Really, whatever you've got on tap. <laughs> Let me have a sip. Uh, thank you so much for having us on your podcast. Yeah, this is this is an incredible opportunity that I feel like we're already squandering. Yeah, I, I feel like we're going to make the most of it, but it is a very special opportunity. I really appreciate it. Patreon.com slash Scooby Dudes. Please go donate to our podcast. <laughs> it would mean the world to us, really. Thank you again so much for the opportunity to hawk ourselves here, Mike. If uh, if anybody hasn't already listened to the Scooby Dudes, you should check it out. They they cover. I mean, this is we're gonna probably show you guys at the end of the episode anyways. But since Luke has kind of grabbed the bull by the horns here, uh, it's great stuff. Great conversations. Um, great for a drive for a long drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a drive so long that you've listened to all the other Scooby Doo podcasts out there, and you think, well, I might as well round it out. I'm a completionist after all. Yeah. Do you have an hour and a half commute? Because if so, our podcast is the one for you. <laughs> you have an hour and a... Yeah. That should be your tagline. <laughs> That's perfect. Man, that should be your tagline, Mike. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, Evan. Mike and I will give that to you. Uh, oh, thanks. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, let me try to get us back on track. What are we here to do? Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> the, the Scooby special that we're talking about in this uh, final segment is the most recent special from the second season of Be Cool Scooby-Doo. Not everyone has seen it. It's not available in all regions just yet, which is why it was chosen as the uh, Scooby special of Christmas yet to be. That episode is called Scroogey Doo, uh, written by Tom Conkle, who you may remember from Mysteries on the Disorient Express and Area 51 Adjacent, and directed by Ron Rubio, whose other credits on the show I do not have on hand. <laughs> Did, did you plan this one because it's Christmas yet to be cool? Oh. Scooby-Doo? That's a no, but that's okay. That's still cool. It's <laughs> that, still a good pick. That, no, I, that's in the running for like my favorite pun after the do meaning of Christmas right now. Oh, the do meaning of Christmas is, <laughs> that's golden. That's got to be, is that the name of this episode? Is that what you're calling it? It should be. It should it be. It should be. I'm just, the, I'm just your intern, so don't, you don't have to take my word <laughs> for everything. But this was, I love this episode. I think you had a great pick here. So this episode is unique in that it takes the Scooby cast and throws them back to, I believe it's 1849? Uh, it's in 1843. The yeah. It's December 24th, 1843. Oh, we know this because, of course, this is the date at which the first Christmas cards were produced. Fun fact. Wait, are you serious? This is one of your, your classic Luke deep dives. Any, anytime a date is mentioned, I feel the need to search it out. Normally it's cool stuff like assassinations, but this time the, the first Christmas cards were introduced on in 1843. It's also the publication date of uh, the original A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Oh, wow. So that's part of the reason why I assume they picked this date. Most likely. Um, so yeah, most likely, it's a, mm -hmm. it was, most likely it was dated that because of the, the Christmas Carol. I'm 
I'm glad you did the research because I did not. It's the only bit I did, so enjoy. Um, <laughs> Luke's part in this episode I, is now complete. Yep, I, I will now be exiting. Thank you. I, to your point, it, this is a, a framed episode where it sends the gang back in time to this actual date. I don't think there's another one like this that I can remember seeing anywhere in the Scooby-Doo canon. There, yeah. is, there is the Grease is the Word episode, mm. which in the episode, have either of you seen Grease is the Word yet? I have not. That no? wasn't, again, I did one okay. piece of research. It features the characters in a framing sequence where they get trapped in this Grecian temple and uh, they start figuring out, uh, I believe Velma starts figuring out how to get out by reading this story, which in classic sort of sitcom manner, the characters themselves aren't like necessarily mm -hmm. supposed to be back in ancient Greece, but their char the, the, our characters are kind of What's the they're word experiencing for? the retelling of the story so vividly they're transported there in their minds and that's kind of where it, it takes place yeah so it's, we yeah. understand that it's it's a fiction within the, the the episode which is kind of different than how it plays out here exactly i mean i i was really thrown by it because isn't this essentially like the sherlock christmas special of scooby-doo episodes but at the, in the sherlock he wakes up at the end of it this is more oh. like the five -hole, um mystery of new york where everything that came before was a dream. Uh, and this is the base reality. How many times have brought up Five Old Goes West on our podcast? <laughs> it's almost every week. <laughs> and and the disservice that that was done by the subsequent sequel. I'm sorry, we're getting off topic. Uh, I, think, I think what we really are all touching on is the fact that this is a really interesting and unique setup. The fact that um, the story set up, it takes place in uh, the 1800s, and then when we are introduced to the gang, they are ostensibly were born and raised in the 1800s. And they're just yeah. arriving in London from America for a science symposium, which Velma wants to attend. Yeah, and, and just to bring it, the, the connection to reality is that it's all a dream that Fred had when he bonked his head before getting on the ship or something like that. So that's, that is the mystery ink that we know in the modern day. But this is the reality of this episode. And uh, I'm sorry if this is... I think oh, you're I'm extrapolating sorry, there a little bit, Luke. I think. Am uh, I? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going yeah, on what, limb. what is? Okay, you're saying you're saying this with such confidence. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a proven fact. I did one other piece of research. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's the oh. thing where where Fred says it. It seems like only yesterday that we left America, and then they're like, "Well, yeah, it does feel like that to you because you hit your head and knocked yourself oh. out. It's been, you know, mm. a month." <laughs> yeah, that was a very clever fake out. Luke, like Luke said that with so much assuredness in his voice, I wanted to reach through the internet, pull off his mask, and be like, Tom Conkle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did write this episode. No, I, okay, so I, I read a lot more into that than I should have, but I was waiting for the moment where it did turn out to be a dream, or when we connected this up with the reality that we're familiar with with Scooby-Doo. I guess that just doesn't happen. It's, it's, I mean... What makes this episode kind of unique is that it was the first episode in what was supposed to be taking these characters and sort of transposing them into different periods and uh, different sort of classic stories. And because the show never continued, it never got explored really any further than this. So it kind of exists on its own and it's sort of this weird outlier because of that. Huh. Well, I have to say, I would have loved seeing other iterations of this. I have no idea what else they would have touched on, but uh, I, I think it's a, it's a format that could have held up. I do think it speaks to the, the strength of the concept of Scooby-Doo. I mean, I've long kind of argued that in pop culture, if something has really worked its way into the zeitgeist or the public consciousness, you know, you can take a character or a show or a story and you can mess with it in ways this is something that has often been done with like the dc comics characters you know like you can take superman and go oh, what if he landed in russia and was raised by russians yeah, red or sun. red sun one of my favorite comic books ever thank you yeah or you know uh, gotham by gaslight like let's have batman go up against jack yeah. the ripper and people don't go oh my god that's not batman that can't happen they go oh well, that's an interesting take and then like you can have so many you can have batman 66 you can have you know, Ben Affleck Batman, you can have Christian Bale Batman, they can all exist in this sort of super context where everyone just accepts it. And I think Scooby-Doo is one of those things where, you know, you can have Shaggy and Scooby get a clue, you can have uh, Mystery Incorporated, you can have Be Cool, you can have Where Are You, you can have 13 Ghosts, and it doesn't diminish 
sort of the franchise in the sense that you don't just instantly stop watching or paying attention to Scooby-Doo. It's just, it's one take and you move on and you wait for like the next iteration to come around. And I feel like these characters are so ingrained and we know them so well that you can just throw them in, you know, Victorian dress and period and just make jokes and have fun with it. And you just sort of roll with it and you accept it. Yeah. Yeah. Luke and I have sort of discussed putting the gang like different scenarios and we sort of came to the conclusion that a mystery is always necessary or something along those lines. I th even the current Scooby Apocalypse, there's still like an underlying mystery behind the narrative that's taking place there. Mm. The spirit um, of mystery. <laughs> but what I really yeah. liked about sort of, what do you say, what do you say, interpose, transposing them onto A Christmas Carol? Yes. Um, is the idea that there are ghosts baked into the story already. Exactly. Oh, and yeah, it's it, Christmas. It does make this like a good it, setup, so. Yeah, it really works for it because, you know, it's your Christmas episode and it has ghosts. And what the ghost is supposed to show you is sort of how you've gone wrong in your life or what you, you know, what you need to do better for things not to turn out the way they are. So you could really play with, like, that's one of the things that I liked about the episode where you don't really see Scrooge's experience. <laughs> Scrooge is experiencing the ghost, but they're really going after Velma. That, that was the amazing thing about this episode is that Scrooge's experience was, it was almost a joke how we glossed past it. The ghosts would just be talking to Velma and she'd be like, hey, aren't you here for Scrooge? Oh yeah, we already talked to him. It's doing, it's working. It, we, we're, do, we're good. And it does get explained at the end where the culprit was, you know, since Velma was the smartest one and most liable to figure it out, he targeted both Scrooge and Velma. But Can, can we put big, like, air quotes around, like, explained? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, zing! Evan coming out swinging. Uh, like, I'll do respect to, like, Tom Conkle. Like, I, I love Be Cool Scooby-Doo. I know he's been, been responsible for a lot of the writing. But there are some deep dives into Velma's past. There is, yeah. Yeah, I, I I think they're they're two to Mike's point. I think it 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 does kind of enrich my experience of Scooby Doo to see them all transposed into this uh, into this setting. I I love that they explore the backstory of all these characters as if they lived in Victorian time, not Victorian, whatever times these are, eighteen hundreds. That's Victorian. That was Victorian. Victorian. Yep, yeah, that's exactly what I meant because I know history. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, Vel, it, it was amazing. Velma's almost the protagonist. I'd say maybe in the majority of Be Cool episodes, it seems. She has so much presence, such a focus on her. And it is it is so wonderful. I think that's why, Luke, you and I appreciate Be Cool so much, is Velma is very often given short shrift. Oh yeah, in a lot of other series. I don't know, I, I, maybe you disagree, Mike, and you feel like Velma has too much presence in other series. And so it's a welcome relief when she takes a step back. I think it goes back and forth. I think different series focus on different characters. Mm. I think, well, I mean, part of the focus when they created this show was they wanted to give everybody more agency. And I think they did that with Daphne, and I think they did that with Fred. I know they were reacting to Fred just being focused on traps <laughs> <laughs> in Mystery Incorporated, which I personally loved. But oh, and, and there's that great. growth. See, there's Fred likes traps, but Fred also has this vision of them graduating high school and all living together. Like they're in a dorm. Oh yeah, like a bunk bed with Shaggy. He has many dreams. They're small, but they're many. Um, it's it's interesting that you you see this as a, an example of where Fred is given more agency because in my mind, in all other series of Scooby Doo where Fred is present, he has all of the agency. There's no more to give him. You can only take away from his share. <laughs> now it's getting political. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm calling you out, Fred. I'm gonna do it. Hashtag Me Too. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> Oh, boy. Um, let me see. Sorry, I don't want to take us too far off topic. Where were we at? Uh, we were just... We were talking about Velma's talking backstory. About yeah. And and how much the focus was on Velma. You guys haven't seen... Most of the world hasn't seen most of season two. But mm -hmm. there are episodes... Like, the first episode of season two is very much a Fred episode. And there's the How to Train Your Coward episode, which focuses very much on Scooby and Shaggy. And this mm. is very much a Velma episode. I'm trying to think of a big Daphne episode, but nothing is popping into my head at the moment. I, th I think they give Daphne a pretty solid plot line almost every episode. I mean, she's got a hobby of the week kind of thing. The, the Daphne uh, du jour. The Daphne du jours, yeah. yeah. Uh, agreed. And I kind of felt like that was honestly pulled back a little bit for this episode. I mean, mm. she decided that she was going to try and... <laughs> I love the line where she says, we decided to decorate to fool the ghosts into thinking that Scrooge has found Christmas cheer. 
Yeah, like... But she doesn't really do anything beyond that. That, that. You're right, that is a very small role that she holds here, and it doesn't have really much big impact on where the episode goes. I don't think any of the characters um, outside of Velma really have a lot to do. And I would say Scooby might have the least to do out of anyone. Yeah, I think Scooby has like a couple lines in the whole show. And then other than that, they're just eating... And that's pretty much it. I think they scream at the ghost when the ghost is standing behind Velma. Yeah, this yeah. is really a Velma mm. episode. Like, I think if you showed this to someone who had never seen any Scooby-Doo at all, they would assume that this was just a show about Velma Dickley. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I also think, uh, here's a question. Do we think it's fair the way the, framed is episode, it, the, the episode is framed as a critique of Velma's dissatisfaction with mysteries? It, it felt like she was being chastised, ultimately, by the story here. I, I think that's valid, no. but I do think part of the part of what I like about this episode is Velma gets really grumpy, and she's really disappointed, and she's kind of, like, angry at how people are missing the obvious things, and they're ignoring her, you know, we all came here for the symposium, and you guys have just gotten caught up in this mystery, and it's it's that feeling of being... Your opinion is not doesn't matter. You're disregarded. But then mm. she sees at the end that her anger and her disappointment will lead to her going to a very dark place. <laughs> yeah. and Where she ultimately becomes the villain. Mm -hmm. Also bear in mind that she's hypnotized, so this is all in her head. The ghosts aren't really showing her a true reality, but she's working this through internally. And, and there's is... a fuzzy line there between what, what she's being hypnotized to see and what she's just what's just uh, introspection. If she is being chastised, she's chastising herself. She's probably questioning herself and thinking, you know, I'm the smart one. I have I invented toilet paper, and it went nowhere because I started hunting down mysteries. It, yeah. It's sort of I kind of got. I mean, it's a wonderful life. You know how how he discovers what the world would be like without him. You know, I kind of feel like... Oh, yeah. There's a mm -hmm. little bit of that sort of in there, even though this is ultimately the structure of A Christmas Carol. Because we're not seeing Scrooge being a crappy person, being converted to somebody who realizes just how crappy, you know, the world would be if he continues doing what he does. There's that moment where Velma realizes she is valuable and she is important and... There is a message of friendship, and she kind of learns the due meaning of Christmas. <laughs> I guess, for me, as in It's a Wonderful Life, I think she worked her way to the wrong conclusion. you got to look out for number one, Dinkley. I think she she also assumed that if she uh, solved mysteries instead of making inventions, someone else would just invent all this stuff, as if inventions are like buried treasure out in the woods. that like, And so, somebody's going to run into it sooner or later. And I, I do think we've been short shrifted a number of great inventions over history because this version of Velma didn't become an inventor. Instead, she solved mysteries. Like, for me, I really like the general sort of idea or, or theme that Velma isn't as appreciated as she should be. Um, like, the, the 2002 Scooby-Doo movie really ran with that, where she's just like, oh, like, I'm the smart one, I solve everything, but people don't really give me the credit that I deserve. And with this, I like that the direction they took it was... If I wasn't, like, chained or held back by Mystery Incorporated, look at all the great things I could do. I do think this is also a theme that was explored with all of the characters to a certain degree in Season 2, which, again, unfortunately, still remains kind of out there in the ether for many people. But that mm. first episode of Season 2, swear to God, i got to find out what that first episode is called. You know, it deals with Fred's sort of uh, obsession with mystery and... Uh, the How to Train Your Coward, where Scooby and Shaggy are like, we're sick of being bait all the time, and they are training two new guys to take their places. That's right. I haven't seen that one, but I've seen screenshots of it. I know I'm going to love that. So far, just from memory, like the majority of the characters in this season have had to reevaluate sort of their role or be reevaluated uh, their role in the group by the group. Hmm. I think this kind of rolls with that and fits with that. Yeah, I could see that. Here's here's a thought. Is Daphne in Be Cool Scooby-Doo the new Scooby-Doo in that she is the unwavering core of the group? She she never wavers and never falters. But even Scooby-Doo second guesses his place and his friendship with everyone at some point. That's interesting because Scooby is generally considered the heart of the group, right? I yeah, think so, I, but I think he, I he many times uh, reconsiders his place there in Be Cool. And Daphne never does. 
Oh, The Curse of Kaniaku. That was a Daphne episode where she was, her look and style was kind of uh, admired and copied by the Japanese when they show up in Japan. Now, I think they're showing up because of something to do with Daphne. Velma feels a little bit kind of short shrifted. All of a sudden, Velma's look and style becomes really hip and appropriated, and Daphne sort of feels that loss of attention. And she has to sort of come to terms with her friendship with Velma and her role in the group. So take that memory. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, that Daphne does really have an episode. Cool. That sounds like the one episode that could pass the Bechdel test. Actually, I think a lot of Scooby could pass the Bechdel test because there's no relationships. So? There's, I mean, you're right. There's not a lot. And there's like plenty of opportunity for the two women to address each other by name. I'm just thinking there's not a lot of times where they're both alone in a scene together. Like the old, the last episode I can remember that even has a remote relationship thread in it is the uh, American Goth, mm. where Shaggy mm. gets interested in this uh, girl that he used to know when they were kids, and she's a goth now, and Shaggy goes all goth to kind of impress her. But beyond that, like, what other episode has there been? I mean, there was a flirtation in the party, like it's 1899, where the dude was trying to get with Daphne, but Daphne was just like, yeah, pew pew. <laughs> yeah, I do remember nice. that. <laughs> Smooth as silk. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, that's what, a, a lot of interesting big picture stuff. Sorry, go ahead. So one thing that I think is really cool about this episode is because it does take that sort of like Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future, all seen through Velma's eyes. And I sort of wanted to maybe discuss our thoughts and our feelings about like seeing the gang as children and also seeing the gang as like nonagenarians i guess wait as what they were in like their 90s like not non nonagenarians oh okay oh yeah so we see them as uh they're you, they're do we know they're in their 90s so they're not octogenarians you know what they they throw <laughs> they throw out like the year or something like that i think you could have like done the math with the age that scooby gives but i did not do that you wanted to use nonagenarians and fine good job bravo Good job. Mike and I are real impressed over here at our podcast. <laughs> so we, we do see the bookends of the kids, them as kids and them as very old people. Is that what? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. I thought it was fun to see um, them as children, not through the same lens as um, a pup named Scooby-Doo. Oh, yeah. Completely different. Also dated. But um, yeah, them as like poor American street urchins. Were they poor, though? I guess everyone looked poor. They, they were wearing the fingerless gloves. To me, that, that always says you can't afford a glove with gloves with real fingers. What I loved is that bikers. even even Scooby had little fingerless uh, paw gloves. <laughs> paw gloves, yeah. Uh, they they looked poor to me. Although I guess Velma was educated, so she couldn't have been truly poor. I, like to me, it made me think that, I, or rather, I like to think that even though it took place in the 1800s, this was still a generally accurate um, depiction of like what her what possibly her real childhood was like. Do we, yeah, do we take that right. to be part of it? Like, that this is their canon childhood just transposed. Man, that's a fun word. Thanks, Mike. Back onto the <laughs> 1800s. Ooh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that with me to our podcast. I mean, I, yeah. Our podcast. I, I like the idea that it's like, she was she was sort of like a bookish nerd and a shut-in, and then, like, these neighborhood kids were kind of like, hey, like, help us solve mysteries. I think and it's also important, mom though. And Scooby and Shaggy with food. I think it's also important, though, that uh, it should be seeing them as kids and the way that they're behaving should be viewed through the lens of this is Velma's memory. This is Velma's perspective. So Fred being a little too gung ho, you know, it, when he goes and he like erases the board and starts mm -hmm. writing the raccoon scratches, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that could just be like Velma's perception of Fred as yeah. being a little uh, boorish and unreliable narrator a little bit there there are several layers of unreliability with the whole that she's hip she's hypnotized for one thing it's a lot an age-old memory and she's working through emotional issues so she could be reframing stuff so it might not be exactly right really quick, and she's mad about the, the symposium too <laughs> oh yeah and the symposium is going to be a factor which that couldn't have been accurate because they did make it to the symposium apparently or they stuck around a year till next year's symposium <laughs> That's and never clarified, but that's an interesting point, Luke. <laughs> never clarified. Yep. I think they were probably a late entry. Yeah, it must be that. Once but they it, solved it, everything. Because they probably didn't push the trial back all that time, because what's his, the the uh, the villain was still there with them when they made it there. Uh, I mentioned... How about 
Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Evan. I mean, I, I just sort of wanted to switch gears and be like, how about the gang as, uh, I don't know what the politically correct term is. Is it like mature adults? As the elderly? <laughs> oh, that's a nice word. I should start calling my grandmother that instead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, it's, I mean, it's sad seeing... It's sad seeing everyone really old. I like the joke that Scooby makes that he's like over 500 years old in dog years because at a certain point you do have to acknowledge that Scooby will not live as old as long as everyone oh, else. Luke, you and I have talked about this in depth, that the dog and a pup named Scooby-Doo is not the same dog that we see later. Yeah, kind of like, you know, when parents um, have like a cabinet full of fish bowls with fish in them to replace one of the fish dies, the gang has just a kennel in the back of which one of their houses with lots of little Scooby Doos, <laughs> they just pull a new. Yeah, they, and they just don't tell Shaggy. <laughs> it's for Shaggy's benefit. So Luke, what you're saying is the role of Scooby is very much like the role of James Bond, where it's played by different that, people that's over a, time. Better than the Phantom, which is what came to mind for me. Yeah, let's go with James Bond. Wait, that's why the you're Phantom, the most on the internet. Like that purple yeah. guy in Africa. That yeah, is what I mean. The purple guy in Africa. Yeah, but yeah. that's more about fighting Implant pirates. Superhero. So. I, I think it's so funny, like, when you think about uh, heroes or, like, big characters um, that you love, you're kind of like, I think some small part of you doesn't want to see them very old. You kind of want to see them go out in their prime. You mean you want to see them die young? Or, or like, like, you want them to, you want them to, to, to cease existing at their best point. Well, in fiction. I don't mean in real life. I think you just don't want to witness the decline, even in your imagination. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you guys, mm. some of the gags in the show, the raccoon gag. Oh, the raccoon Love gag. it or hate it? I, I, at the <laughs> end, you mean? Like at the close? Just in general. Just the the the, repeat, the repetition of, at, at the heart of every mystery in America are raccoons. That That I really liked. And I thought that the punchline to that is when Fred erases the blackboard and is like, someone stole a pie from Mrs. Johnson's sill. They left all these strange markings. What do you think they are? <laughs> it's like three tick marks in small groupings. And it's, it's raccoons. Definitely raccoons. That, I, that was the perfect building joke for me because it snowballed each time, added it a little bit, and got a bigger laugh out of me. And then the ending, of course. Oh, the, yeah, where... Uh, the ending, I didn't love, personally. With the raccoons running out of the body? Yeah, it it seemed to, like Be Cool Scooby Doo. I think is the weirdest of all the shows. They're the most willing to uh, push the boundaries with comedy and like do like fun or different things. But it seemed like a hair too cartoonish for me. Just my opinion. It kind of does call back to some of the earlier kind of Scooby shows where Scooby would be interacting with other animals and they'd be kind of causing trouble. That, that was a really common element in most of the early Scooby-Doo, is that whenever Scooby interacts with another animal, the animal is invariably puckish and mischievous towards him and, and causes a lot of havoc. For, for me, I really love that at the very end, Ms. Blackwhite, the kind of decrepit, um, near-corpsey um, caretaker of Scrooge's household, turned out to be three raccoons stacked one on top of another. That, that really worked for me for whatever reason. How did you feel about the gag where Scrooge told her to go in the kitchen and straighten up? <laughs> that was more so-so for me. <laughs> I really like that. Was that a little too, really like that. A little too <laughs> on the nose? <laughs> I found her character very funny. Just the way they drew her and the little bit of the small touches of voice acting that they threw on there. I thought that was very funny, but that was about it. I think my favorite gag in the whole show was when Fred goes, okay, gang, light him up. <laughs> <laughs> when they're about to go looking for clues and they need light, and then they each individually light a lantern. Yeah. Like Daphne's uh, got... Like, Labra. And, very and it takes them like a couple minutes to get all the candles and stuff going, and then Scooby sneezes, and he's like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was... You're exactly right. That is an incredible scene. It's painfully funny. It was beautiful. I think what's great about it is that you know, OK Gang, Light em Up is in pretty much every episode of this series, so it's it's kind of subverting that thing that you expect, right? You mean them, like, opening fire with a bunch of AK-47s? Because that's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> light em Up. All right, Gang, Light em Up it sounds like something that a, that a crime lord would say to his, uh, to his minions. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like when you pulled up to the coffee shop where your rival gang is based. And, uh... I, I I also love that scene. For me, one of my favorite lines was just one of the anachronistic kind of lines they threw in there. Um, when the doctor's leaving and Fred throws out, we'll call you when the telephone is invented. 
It's very, very <laughs> subtle. Very, very subtle. We're, it's, we're there and we're gone, but it really worked. Also, that sounded sarcastic. I'm serious. It was subtle and, like, very well done. Yeah, because the telephone was not invented yet. Because Velma didn't get the opportunity. That's right, but somebody would have invented it. Any, we know how inventions work. Yeah. One I, thing that's uh, not... Sorry, one thing that's no, not a yeah, joke. Before. But uh, when we're in the graveyard, we pan past a tombstone that has the letters H-R-Y-C-I-U-K on it. and Yeah, it's like Hrychuk or Hrysiuk or something. Okay, so yeah. not just me. I could not find anything for that anywhere online. That's the other piece of research I tried to do, and I got nothing for it. I can only assume that it is just one of those things where it's like maybe somebody who was a background painter or something, and they just kind of put a name there. Apparently there are a few people out there who have last names who, which are this, but no one that's explicitly tied to Scooby-Doo. I thought maybe it was, hey, Rudolph, you can't ignore the United Kingdom. Um, but <laughs> that's a guess. That is just my conjecture. I'm not going to frame that like, Freddy, this is all Freddy's dream. I don't have that level of certainty to it. It'd be interesting if it had some significance for Velma, seeing as this was Velma's hypnotic dream. It oh, feels yeah. so intentional. It's really waved right in the viewer's face. It feels like there must be something well, yeah, there. Yeah, it, it lingers there for a second. A real moment. You feel, you feel like you're supposed to get something out of that, but Google doesn't help me anyway. Um, uh, Google. So a question I had about sort of the way that this episode wraps up narratively is, I think when you think of Scooby-Doo, you kind of think of it as being a feel-good show. Like, would you guys agree with that? Yeah. I, I mean, for me, it makes me feel good. It's a Saturday morning, eat it with sugary cereal kind of show. That's feel good for me. Uh, and It generally has a, a more upbeat kind of humor and positive ending to it, yeah. But with this episode, with the way that things end with, with Scrooge and with, um, what's his name, Marley? Is that his... Marley was his Marley dead is, partner. Marley's the dead partner, Cratchit, yeah. Cratchit. Bob Cratchit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I was just like, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty dark... Uh, conclusion, right? Um, because Scrooge does not learn anything. Well, he did learn, but he was tricked into learning. Dr. Bugley was the villain, and he was taking advantage of Scrooge's hypochondria to give him a whole bunch of huckster snake oil treatments, and then wanted to convince Scrooge to be a nice guy so he could also make Scrooge pay for medical treatments for a lot of other people. And, but as they're dragging yeah. Bugley away, he's like, you guys ruined it. Like, I almost had Scrooge convinced, and now he's just going to continue being a selfish jerk. Yeah, like, he's not going to help anyone. And Scrooge is, like, dancing, like, I don't have to help anyone anymore. I'm going to go back to my tiny little pile of money and <laughs> swim in it back in my home. <laughs> his, is... his miniature uh, his miniature Scrooge McDuck vault. There, that was definitely a Scrooge McDuck <laughs> reference, and I loved it. It was well, so pathetic when you imagine the, the real thing. He, he did say he was hiding from the ghost in his makeshift money cocoon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> makeshift money cocoon, yeah. Mm. Uh, but I think that it's... I think there's a balance there because Velma's at the symposium and Velma talks about her experience and sort of sums everything up where she's like, I can be both, you know? Like, I can continue being part of the gang and solving mysteries. She, she finds the value. You know, there's a, a positive character arc for Velma, but... Yeah, what's normally the Scooby story, like the mystery, it does kind of end up a little dark. Yeah, it, I think you're right, though. It is a happy ending for Velma because she's validated in that um, forensics is a science and there is invention to that. And so she's contributing and she can still pass that on. So it's a happy ending for the main character of this episode. Um, the, the more tertiary characters of Bob Cratchit and his family all die off screen we assume uh, yeah the the five tims and the one greg greg five tims and greg <laughs> but also, i think sorry go ahead i was just gonna say but i think because we all know how a christmas carol ends because we all know that story it's been around since 1843 thank you luke you know the, the story we're focusing on is the velma story we only care about the scooby characters if their story ends up wrapped up, you know, with a nice little bow, that's awesome. And the rest of it is just collateral damage. Yeah, as long as the okay. gang doesn't die of influenza, who, who really cares? I, I mean, I think at its heart, it's very funny that the scheme involves making someone a good person, but with, like, ulterior, like, evil yeah. motives. And it's, it, it's such, like, a moral conundrum when you sort of pick it apart. It feels like it would be, like... Uh, like an episode on The Good Place. It, it, to me, this feels like the, the ending of The Watchmen, which is like, oh, do, what do we do now? And um, 
I'm trying to think of what character is Rorschach at the end of this. <laughs> I guess Cratchit and the Tims because they die. Uh, but it's, it's a, one thing I will say to console us that it was going to be bad anyways is that Dr. Bugley is a quack. He's definitely not like a very good doctor. So the treatment he would have given to Cratchit and Cratchit's kids probably wouldn't have cured them. He's just looking to to get a little money out of them. So there you go. I mean, didn't Tiny Tim have like polio or something? Can you even cure that? I don't think he did have a disease. I think he was just a layabout who used that crutch as a crutch. <laughs> he was so lazy, he could have used his own two feet. Yeah. <laughs> he needed a third foot. So he greedy. Was so lazy, he didn't want his left leg. He didn't grow his left leg as much as his right leg. You know, like, honestly, dude, I have glasses, and it's just because I don't feel like looking hard enough. Evan I use doesn't like these, focusing uh, his eyes. I lazy. use these lenses. <laughs> To make I'd, up the difference. I'd be more critical of you, but I'm too lazy to grow my hair out past my <laughs> very high hairline. So what can I say, really? I do think that this ending, though, it fits with the subversive nature of Be Cool. I, I think so. Yeah. I, and, you know, Be, Be Cool is always... The people who make it, you know, the stuff that they're influenced by and they love, you know, it's that Marx Brothers humor, that Monty Python humor, you know... They're they're bringing that off kilter, slightly askew humor to it. So having it end that way, it I didn't think of it. I mean, I I felt it was dark, but I wasn't like sad that it was dark. I kind of had that little snicker and brush it under the the couch kind of attitude <laughs> towards the stuff that was not pleasant. I agree with you, Mike. I find the suffering of the poor very funny. I think that <laughs> that's why we make such a good team. <laughs> Agreement. Oh man. And I guess so. Hang on. Did we did we touch on what the do meaning of Christmas is? Did we get it? Uh, well, I think I think trying to transmit the do meaning of Christmas to the audience was just talking about what we love about this show, this franchise, and these yeah. episodes, and how you know these episodes they're funny and joyful and a fun way to celebrate Christmas. I, I think. I, in the in the context of like be cool Scooby Doo specifically, which isn't to say anything about like other iterations, it, I think it's what you said that it's funny and it's fun, but also like a really well done character exploration, which like mm. only adds to my enjoyment. I agree with that. I think for me, the do meaning of Christmas is the the individual's responsibility to manage their own health care. That's my big takeaway, and it's a valuable lesson that Cratchit should have learned. Luke, you realize that, like, you're on a Skype call with, like, two Canadians. Yeah, <laughs> and I have no health insurance. I recognize this. I'm riding the razor edge. <laughs> I'm an American, and I will die young. But you will die proud and free. Yeehaw. Probably to a <laughs> raccoon. I'll probably yeehaw. die to a raccoon. I said yeehaw. <laughs> you, can't even, you can't even get the yeehaw, right? Yaw. Yaw. Hmm. You know, I rather like that uh, discussion, particularly the parts in the beginning. Do I really sound like that? No, oh, anyway. That concludes our journey. Our work here is done. I hope you found value in our visitations and fun, and have a better understanding of the do meaning of Christmas. I certainly hope that because uh, I really have no interest in coming back and doing this again. Just because I'm dead doesn't mean I don't have better things to do with my time. For those of you who weren't paying attention this holiday season, you should uh, embrace the family and friendships you have, and don't take any of them for granted. Help others less fortunate than you when you can. A little mystery is nice to spice things up from time to time, and never turn down an all-you-can-eat Christmas dinner. Merry Christmas to you, and God bless us! Everyone. Ha ha ha! Drafty in here, isn't it? Mm. Wow, so that just happened. Welcome back. Uh, I don't really know what to say. That was, uh, that concludes the first, what is hopefully an annual tradition uh, a podcast named scooby-doo christmas special i want to thank everybody who was involved it was a crazy enterprise to get into i came up with the idea for it just this week it was logistically it should have been a nightmare but everybody involved just bent and twisted their schedules to make it work which is 
amazing and has been just a truly wonderful Christmas gift to me. So I want to give a shout out to Luke and Evan from the Scooby Dudes podcast who are guesting on the show for the very first time. We had uh, Nick Robes from the What's With You Scooby-Doo podcast and Billy Seaguire from the Scooby-Doo's or Scooby-Don'ts podcast. Unfortunately, we couldn't get uh, Amelia Wellman from the Scooby-Doo's or Scooby-Don'ts podcast on the show, but Amelia was here with us in spirit, if not in voice. And we had two very special guests, very, very special guests in the forms of John Colton Berry, story editor for Be Cool Scooby-Doo, who was the guest ghost host in our second segment with Nick Robes and contributed to the madness there. And we also had the very talented voice actor, comedian, and writer of several Be Cool Scooby-Doo episodes, Tom Conkle, who really at the 11th hour uh, agreed to do the Jacob Marley voiceover. And I think Tom actually recorded it on his iPhone as he was traveling to visit family this Christmas. Everybody just went above and beyond on this project, so if you bump into any of these people online, be sure to give them a high five or a thumbs up and just let them know how awesome they are. And if any of them are listening to this, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for all of your help. I couldn't have done this without you guys. This has been a fabulous Christmas present for me, and uh, in the process of sort of trying to make something kind of, you know, special and Christmas gifty for my great listeners, I ended up getting a wonderful gift as well. As corny as that sounds. But it's Christmas, so I mean, corny is the order of the day. I also want to point out that we're going kind of crazy long on this episode. We're over two hours. It is the longest episode we've done yet. But in the middle of segment two, we have... uh, 23 minutes of that is a good solid audio commentary on Scary Christmas, uh, conducted by myself, John Coltenberry, and Nick Robes. At some point, I am going to do an isolated commentary track and release it that way. That was kind of a special surprise gift that we wanted to sort of throw in there as well, instead of just talking about the episode, do it like that. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. In the spirit of Christmas and in, in the spirit of friendship and everybody sort of coming together for this project, I wanted to reach out and kind of include everybody. The Christmas Carol format of the episode of the presentation, it didn't really accommodate sort of everybody being involved, but it's such a great podcasting community and there's so many great Scooby-Doo podcasts out there. I'm a big supporter of everybody who's kind of out there supporting this show and supporting this fandom. And I wanted to include everybody. So I put out a call and everybody responded. So I'm going to have a little special little thing right at the end of the episode. And I should probably just add that the uh, Meddling Kids podcast wanted to contribute, but unfortunately I didn't get what I needed in time. So while they're not technically included, uh, they were asked and they were game. And so they're kind of included uh, in spirit, if not in voice. So thank you guys so much for joining me for this. Uh, You're amazing. This was amazing. You can let me know what you think on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram. Uh, Tell your friends. Share the show. Visit the other podcasts. Check out these other podcasts. Uh, One of the really cool things about this show was, while it was completely unintentional, the, the first segment with Billy, I kind of feel like that was the best version of the Scooby-Doo's or Scooby-Don'ts show that I could produce. The second segment with Nick and John was kind of the best version of Nick's show, What With You Scooby-Doo, that I would produce. And the third segment is kind of, you know, what if I was making a Scooby-Doo's episode? I kind of feel like they're all very representative of the shows that the guest hosts came from which was crazy and and cool and I don't know if they would agree but that's kind of the sense that I got and if you kind of like those segments that's kind of what their shows are like so yeah go to their shows go to the shows of the people who aren't on the episode just everybody share the love spread it around and seeing as how it is Christmas Eve I want to send season's greetings to all of my listeners everybody out there much love I hope everybody's having a safe and happy holiday. I will be back in January with another episode. I hope you are back with me.
So with that, I take my leave of you. Take care, and remember... Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to all of you at home. Hey everyone, this is Michael. And this is Brett. And we're from Meddlers Incorporated. We would like to wish you... Merry Christmas. A very, very Merry Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas to uh, everyone out there in uh, Scooby Land, and uh, I hope you all have uh, safe, happy, healthy holidays, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Merry, Merry Christmas! <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, everyone. This is Ralph Cramp, independent investigator and spokesman for the Scooby-Doo Justice Project podcast. When we were invited to give this little Yuletide greeting at the end of Mr. Jozik's show, we were made to understand that if we refused, things would go very badly for us. So I will say we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, but I won't mean it. Want to say Merry Christmas, Jones?